Yes, Vartika, you can start. Good morning, everybody. And I think uh, I am really, really happy Saturday morning, 10 o'clock. And I have so many people on this call ready to learn more uh, in terms of HR. So uh, thank you so much, everybody who joined in the call today. Thank you for uh, coming in, sharing uh, time and pulling out time from your busy schedules and being a part of this uh, workshop that we have today, which is called the HR Playbook. Uh, Veer, I'm sorry, but I'm not able to see the screen. I would request everybody to please be on mute so that we can stream easily. Thank you so much, V, for sharing this. Uh, and you know, before we start the workshop, I think it's very easy for, it's very important for all of us to know about the core HRIR group. What is this group about? And what is that we've been doing over a period of time? So uh, HRIR group basically is a group of around 5,000 HR experts. And really proud to say that we have around 5,000 people who are part of this group who are HR experts, who are uh, you know, growing professionals, who are uh, stalwarts, and they're from Fortune 500 companies, HR leaders, CHROs, leading HR minds. Uh, you know, the objective of setting up the core HRIR group uh, was basically to become a globally acclaimed platform for HR professionals, for sharing knowledge, insights, building learning blocks, knowledge boards, and brainstorm. And I think we've been really, really uh, able to do all of this with all your support and participation. Uh, we also aim at creating a uniquely uh, curated community across the globe for senior HR professionals which focuses on contemporary strategy issues. Um, you know, it is also imperative for us uh, to have the selected uh, notable human resource initiatives focused on sharing futuristic HR strategies, discussion threads, latest HR news, advances and learnings at all. And I'm sure most of you already know about Core HR group. There have been a lot of learnings that have been shared. To me personally, I've learned a lot. I know about a lot of strategies now, a lot of courses, a lot of things that keep coming in the market, all thanks to Core HRIR Group. Uh, it also, you know, uh, has an objective uh, in terms of uh, talking about the challenges and limitations faced by professionals in HR across industries by creating and utilizing the media of communication, including but not limited to webinars, job boards, seminars, knowledge sessions, talent awards. So I think uh, we've been doing all of these activities in the past. We have had uh, workshops, we have had uh, you know webinars in the past. And I think the, the reason why we are moving into a workshop mode is to provide a better learning platform for everybody, more interactive platform wherein you can share your ideas, thoughts. Um, uh, Veer, would you want to highlight something more around the core IR group before we proceed? Okay, great. So we were formed uh, in the year January 2017, and uh, we started with a WhatsApp group of HR professionals. Uh, you know, we also started with a learning weekend series wherein we had uh, speakers coming in from various industries, uh, you know, uh, and they shared their experiences. We started on May 26, 2018. That's when the Learning Weekend series started. And uh, people came across, shared their experiences, knowledge, their innovation, their challenges for all of us to learn from. Uh, we also started a Chai Buddy series, which was very well taken, started in November 19, 2017. And it was basically a special version of the HR Conclave which helps the fraternity members uh, to, you know, expand their visions, their learnings, their capabilities, their networking ability, their analytical and strategy knowledge. And I think that is what the idea was. Our Bangalore chapter started in the year 2018. October 10 was the date when the Bangalore chapter started. And we also started our Pune chapter in December, December 26, 2018. Uh, we also got the Shining HR Award. We were recognized as young HR professionals who have made outstanding contribution in their respective organizations. So that was the journey so far for core HRIR. Uh, before we proceed with the workshop, uh, we also have Veer who's supporting and who just shared this presentation with us. Veer, would you want to highlight a little more or probably talk a few lines around the core HRIR group?
joining this you know workshop i am very happy that you know you all have enrolled for this workshop uh, so coming to the background of this workshop how we have started so many of the communities and uh, groups are doing lot of webinar and other you know things whereas we want to have a uh, impact on uh, the people those who are you know connected with us and who are part of the group so considering that in mind we have come up with this workshop series and uh, this is not the one workshop that we are doing we are going to do five series of workshop on various topics so the next topic is uh, plan for employee engagement and that is also done by one of the great facilitator like today you know we have currently with us so um, that's all about uh, from my side uh, what thank yeah. you maybe thank you uh, request yeah you can request uh, um, sanad ji if he is is on the call to okay. talk on it All right, Shinaji, would you want to talk a little bit around, uh, you know, core HR IR group, the workshops, or anything that you want to talk about the group? I think he has been locked out, so you can carry on. Uh, okay, yeah. great, great, amazing. So uh, I think uh, let's move on because I think all of you must be really, really excited to move ahead with the workshop. which is hr playbook which is a practical guide to implementation of hr best practices and what is it we are planning to attain out of this workshop is to develop the ability to implement hr best practices in a simple manner aligned with business objectives i think that's what all of us uh, at times struggle with but that's what the objective of this workshop is this course will also support you to be able to set up hr matrices to measure effectiveness of the hr practices so that's what we are going to learn in the workshop today and for this workshop we have an amazing amazing speaker with us today who is harini shrinivasan hi harini hi and good morning to everyone great so i'll just talk about harini in a few lines but there is too much to talk about her so then i'll pass it on to her to take it forward so harini is basically a business transformation evangelist a design thinker a neuroscience enthusiast and behavioral scientist adept in unlocking human potential in organizations 24 years of successful experimentations in the areas of leveraging people potential for business excellence is what harini has 24 years guys i think too much to learn from harini a strong believer in driving one's destiny uh, she believes that you know uh, she believes to practice uh, resilience in her life uh, i think too much to learn from you and you've been in tedx talks and so many things harini i think whatever i talk about you would be less in words so i would pass my voice to you to carry forward in terms of your introduction to the group and also to take up the workshop ahead thank you so much vartika and thanks core hr ir group for this wonderful initiative uh, and vartika your introduction of mine has been way too generous but nevertheless uh, i think let's get the ball rolling quickly because we have a lot to do in the almost 4 hours that we have with us i'm extremely happy to be with so many of you this morning uh, i was i was a little unwell i was feeling very low uh but just seeing so many people in this program has has really pepped me up and i'm absolutely fine ready to go uh i'm very happy for two very specific reasons to be doing this session today one is that this is the first one in this masterclass series uh the design of this masterclass series uh, is something which is uh very unique in the sense that uh, at least in my session what i'm going to do today is a lot of practice and reflections i'm going to be true to every word in in my introduction that vartika just now did uh, i am here to bring out and unlock people potential so i am not going to be doing any kind of a monologue there are going to be tips and tricks here and there but there's going to be a lot ample time uh, for you to reflect and practice um that will be a practice for you to go and implement this right away all the learnings you will be able to implement it right away okay so that is one of the reasons i'm very happy about uh 
is that I'm doing the first in the series. The second reason uh, that makes me really happy to be addressing all of you this morning is yesterday was celebrated as the International Human Resources Day. Uh, and I saw a lot of posts on social media which spoke about uh, generally wishing HR fraternity, talking about HR as heroes. Uh, you cannot spell hero without HNR. Uh, HR is is uh, is a prominent aspect of of the heart. It was one of the Zoho ads, and uh, a good friend of mine also has authored a book, HR in My Heart. So we saw a lot of such things about HR. On the other hand on other social media, I also noticed a lot of cribbing by HR people that uh, we need more recognition. So on World HR Day is when we were all trying to make our visibility, uh, you know, make our presence felt by all. But what I felt we should be doing is uh, on, on the International HR Day and the days following it forever, I think all of us have to take simple oaths. So what I want you to do today is, because we are bang on uh, on the other side of the International HR Day 2022, and we're keep starting this course, this series, I want each one of you to take a, a pen and paper, pencil and paper, whatever, whatever writing material you have in front of you, and write down these three statements. HR is a business enabler. Right. So write down the statement. These, these are your oaths for, for starting from today and forever. HR is the business enabler. HR is not a policing function or HR is not a policeman. And the third one is HR is a decision maker. Right. Do I have everyone with me? So write down these three statements in bold letters, somewhere where it's very much visible to you, please paste them there. If you have a, a pin board in front of you, if you have a whiteboard which you look at every day, if you have a diary which you maintain every day, make sure you write these three statements. This is your oath as an HR professional which you are taking uh, right after the International HR Day. Okay, with that oath, I want to set the context for today's masterclass simply because I'm going to actually walk you through best practices, which are not a typical support function best practices. I'm going to walk you through certain methodologies, certain things that you will do, which are not expected of, of a support function. I'm going to help you understand how important it is to not exercise control and authority, but to enable and empower. So we are going to do a lot of these practices today in terms of understanding each of those concepts that we already know and by reflecting on what we are doing currently and what we ought to be doing, keeping in mind these three statements of both. I'd be happy if one of you volunteers and just quickly types these, these three statements of oath on the chat window so that we can keep referring to it, right? So. If you, have, if you have made crystal clear three oath statements, just feel free to put it on the chat window. Any, any one of you, uh, I leave it to you. Whoever is fastest fingers first. Okay, So we'll use that. We'll keep referring back to it as we go through the slide deck. Uh, hi, Praveen. Good to see you. Okay, so let me share my screen. Uh, I will be using hi, a slide deck. Uh, hi, good morning. Morning, How are morning. You? Good, good. It's so nice I, will be using, I will be using a slide deck, but as always, uh, it's going to be very, very minimalistic. You won't find too much of loaded text because like I said, this is going to be a do-it-yourself, do it hands-on practice. And whatever you take away as the slide deck, all those who have attended today will receive a copy of the slide deck. This is a light workbook. So this will you can use this as a workbook as well. And those of you who have uh, paid and registered for the HR recertification credits, will also get a heavier work, right? So that's how this will go, right? So thanks, uh, Anusha, for putting this up. We keep referring to it. So I'm going to be sharing a slide deck, but it's going to be minimalistic. It's just going to be a guide for us. Okay, so here it is. So we're going to look at HR best practices, and we're also going to take away how to implement them. 
So there are two pictures that you see on the screen in front of you. Okay. Uh, so we are going to take, use the popcorn method. Popcorn method is anybody can unmute, pop up, and speak. What I want you to do is take about thirty seconds, observe both the both the photographs in front of you, and after about thirty seconds, unmute and tell tell me tell the group what is your interpretation of the two photographs. So when I say interpretation of the two photographs, you can talk about similar. And what's different? So compare and contrast both the photographs. Your thirty seconds to look at it, understand, and reflect starts now. Okay, Harini, can I share with the group? Yes. Okay, this is Maheshwari, and I work as head OD and L and D for uh, Anytime Fitness. So, what is my interpretation about these two pictures? Hmm. Uh, so you know, it's about keeping complete organization together in the mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. And second uh, picture talks about you know, even if there's a turmoil, uh, HR does a lot of work to keep everybody safe. And then you know that's how the new mm -hmm. interventions have come into place. We we are talking about wellness. We are talking about mental health. Mm -hmm. We are talking about loneliness, mm -hmm. which is which is there. Okay. Okay, you were a very fast popcorn, Maheshwari. <laughs> that's that's a popcorn like... beef facilitator as well. <laughs> anyway, happy to see you here. Yes. So, Pleasure anyone else again. who has who has, who has uh, been reflecting on these two images, tell me what do you see. Hi everyone, I'm Ruth. Uh, I, I work with eValue Serve. Um, hi Harini. My hi, interpretation of these two pictures is the one, uh, the the one on the left. It looks, you know, they they have a goal. They're very focused. They are practicing. They are training for something. You know, like mm -hmm. they have a goal mm -hmm. clearly. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second one, uh, probably, you know, uh, once they trained and they were ready and they they're probably. Uh, they're having fun for sure, mm -hmm. and they, they probably mm -hmm. won something. Maybe mm -hmm. that's, that's mm -hmm. my interpretation. Interesting, interesting perspective. Thanks, Ruth. Who else? I want to hear at least five voices. We have a big group here. At least five voices. What's your interpretation? Well, Ravi, this side. Yes, Ravi. Uh, I can see the one on the right side have smiling faces, uh -huh. and on the other side have people who have very serious face. Uh -huh. So that is one difference I can observe between the both. Wonderful. Good catch. Great. So two more. Hi, Anusha here. Hi, Anusha. And, and hi, hi. I all I work for a IT organization. Uh -huh. And Welcome. my observation is uh, same as Ravi. The left hand mm -hmm. side uh, seems to be more serious. And mm. but on the right hand side, I believe they are focused in work as well as they love what they do. They, mm. they do it with that's that's what is my observation. Lovely. One more. Uh, Harini Sanjay here. Yes, Sanjay. Uh, I see one is uh, uh, going for a competition. They are competing something. And the uh, other one are uh, enjoying their work and uh, in whatever the situation is. So both Great. are having a different perspective of uh, uh, achieving the goal of Brilliant. Goals. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And good to see you, Sanjay Ji. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, this is really, really an interesting uh, set of images, which I thought would again set the context is and and very beautifully i think all of you also happen to notice the expression on the faces uh, i'm really glad that it came out uh, right up front without me having to point it out uh, if you look at uh, the the picture on the left hand side there is clearly a leader if you look at the picture on the right hand side uh, the, there there is obviously somebody who is an expert but it's not very clearly visible, right? If the picture on the left-hand side, everybody is looking at the leader and the leader is kind of seeming to give instructions and everyone is following exactly what the leader is saying. The picture on the right-hand side, the leader there probably is an expert in river rafting, the skill over there. And the leader there is someone who probably knows what to do when someone falls off the raft. And the leadership skills will be demonstrated only when there is a severe crisis like that. Otherwise, 
everybody is looking in their own direction and they are actually trying to take the raft ahead the picture on the right okay while while the two of them what's common in both the pictures is both are kind of boats and both are in water and both are being rowed right that's common look at a business scenario when the economy is stable when there was no pandemic when things were normal and there is no recession you can have one leader and all of us following what the leader is asking us to do continue to look at the direction of the leader and that was what probably business was like some years back when hierarchical organizational structures started getting developed over a period of time the water has not been as stable as it is on the left hand side the water has become turbulent like you see on the right hand side picture so in turbulent water if you if you row a canoe like the one on the left hand side everyone only looking at the leader they may not be able to survive in this turbulence so when you are in a situation in a turbulent situation like river rafting the risk is the same there also you can drown if you don't know swimming here also you can drown but what is happening on the right hand side picture as many of you rightly pointed out they are all smiling because each one of them probably has been told what is their role what is their goal and each one of them has been told what are the difficulties that they can anticipate what are the ways to navigate through these difficulties look at each other for support and go on but we have to reach the goal on the way enjoy what you are doing so even if that turbulent raft really rocks in in the water we we'll all sitting in that raft will actually laugh and enjoy we might even splash water on each other as we travel in that journey but if the canoe on the left hand side if it starts rocking there will be tremendous amount of pressure on that leader to take this team to safety and to victory right so business has actually changed like this it has changed from a canoe in a boat race to uh, the turbulent river rafting so leadership also needs to change accordingly we no longer will be successful as leaders if we practice leadership like the one on the left hand side we have to learn to equip enable empower our team members because business is like river rafting now it's no longer on calm waters right uh, so take a moment to to look at this picture uh, assimilate and put it in the context of hr best practices because we're going to be referring to these kind of behaviors in whatever we whatever we uh, following slides right so let's look at certain moments of truth as you are dealing with people in the organization in my mind there are five very distinct moments of truth that we will notice one is building trust through transparency mm -hmm. trust is not a simple word as belief or faith okay it's a lot deeper than just that how do you develop trust trust begets trust okay so you have to be trustworthy so that people become trustworthy so in hr how do you how do you actually demonstrate this moment of truth is by building trust through transparency so somewhere we have to come off that feeling that hr information is confidential right very very familiar all of us know right uh, hr will have cabinet with lock and key nobody is allowed to enter hr department also people will say that do not enter uh, uh, you know without without any need so we'll have to move out of all those things when you are trying to build trust through transparency uh, purushottam uh, you'll have to 
mute. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. The second moment of truth is when you are noticing members, everyone in the organization is able to make decisions with accountability. Right? So when people are not coming back to their managers asking questions or asking to be spoon fed, you will know that that's your second moment of truth where you see employee position with accountability. Accountability in the sense, if something goes wrong, there won't be a blame game. If something goes wrong, people will try to fix it rather than fixing the blame on somebody. When something goes wrong, people will try to find out what went wrong rather than who did wrong? Okay, that would be the second moment of truth. The third moment of truth for any HR leader or any HR practitioner is when you develop the ability to measure only what that matters. We talk about HR metrics, we talk about measuring anything and everything, but it is important for us to acknowledge and understand that it is what matters is the only thing that has to be measured. Would we want to really measure how many hours a person spends in the office? Or would it make sense for us to measure what has been the outcome? Would you want to measure the output or do you want to measure the outcome? Now that's how you elevate yourself as a mature HR professional. Third moment leaders and HR professionals is when you notice agility in your teams. There are a few myths about agility, which I want to bust here. Agility is not only speed. A lot of us mistake agility for speed because agile means being fast. But what agile also means is flexible. Right? So if you're able to build in agility in your teams, wherein HR team members become flexible, in their approach to problem solving. If HR team members are able to put people and interactions on top of processes and tools, if HR team members are able to navigate through uh, you know, conversations rather than email snowballing. Now, if we do all of this, you'll, you'll, you'll discover the moment of truth where you see agility in your teams. When I say in your teams, I also mean in HR processes. The fifth, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a consequence of all these four, the fifth moment of truth is innovation as a way of working. When we do not have to celebrate innovation week, quote unquote, innovation week, when we do not have to celebrate that every year as part of our employee engagement, and when innovation is something which is like breathing, which everybody does in everything that they have to deliver, then you know that you have achieved the fifth moment of truth. So the three oath statements which you wrote down, five moments of truth. If you can actually keep this in front of you and keep viewing it every day, you will notice that these become your subconscious goals. Right? So... All of us know all the theories. So we're not going to typically those theory stuff, but we're going to try and link every best practices to, uh, to these five moments of truths. And we're also going, trying to see that we're going to stick to the three oath statements that we took. Right? Now let's look at the employee life cycle because it's important to some some reality, right? Too much of philosophical, motivational speech done. So let's get into some reality. Employee life cycle. Uh, I've picked up five stages uh, to for us to get down into some detailing uh, today. There are intermittent steps as well in the life cycle, but we will not touch upon them. These are us. The first one is recruit, right? So in recruitment, what we are going to do is we are going to look at what are uh, we're going to do some reflections there. We're going to look at certain templates which we can use. I'm going to give you some insights on what are the best practices in recruitment. How do we move away from cliched job descriptions and all of that? We're going to look at onboarding separately because there is a myth in onboarding also which I want to bust. 
uh, we'll be looking at onboarding as a core employee life cycle process stage because that's a very very crucial touch point with the employee it's uh, it's not just uh, a very deep touch point it is also something which has which has a very uh, big expanse so it's a three dimensional touch point so onboarding is very crucial third is the third employee life cycle stage which we're going to look at is develop which is all about talent development and talent development is not only learning and development there's a lot more to it we'll also look at retain and we will spend a lot of time even on the offboarding what we are trying to achieve through these five stages of the employee life cycle is how do you discover these five moments of truth and at the end of these five stages in the employee life cycle are we really able to measure whether employees are converted to brand ambassadors now why i'm talking about brand ambassadors here is many a time we take it for granted that hr has nothing to do when it comes to employer branding uh very recently uh, one of my mentees who is actually pursuing her phd from uh, from chennai university uh, she presented a paper at a, a research conference in budapest in hungary where she spoke about employer branding especially for the gen z and her entire focus was on how hr is is playing a pivotal role in employer branding how does hr do things so employees are uh, employees not just employees and also candidates look at the organization as an employer of choice uh, it doesn't we, come yeah this is selection i can i quickly add because this is something that i have been talking to my potential employees sure. right now yeah i have lived uh, for nine long years in europe and specifically in sweden and denmark and mm. uh, one of the key differences that i've noticed is now today in india people have referred to me saying that uh, the candidates now have lot of offers in hand and that's why uh, until the day they join we do not know if it's a no show or if it's a joiny you know mm. the biggest mm. reason i think for this one is the lack of employer branding in india specifically because if you look at the european market they they talk about the benefits and the advantages of joining them, them as a particular organization mm. not only about the what do you say about the perks or the benefits uh, yes. you know monetarily but otherwise yes yes how would you see yourself you know as a sort of growth in terms exactly. of growth exactly so that that hasn't happened in india because the ratio of employee versus employer has always been you know huge mm. now that that gap is you know narrowing down i think mm. hence it's important in india to work on employer branding very important mm. very important so yeah. yeah i i always used to tell my uh, talent acquisition teams uh, when when i was uh, chro i used to keep telling them that you have to be able to make an offer which cannot be rejected right there is right. no question of negotiation and you very rightly said you're coming from looking at a country like denmark which is extremely people centric and very egalitarian in its approach towards people sure. right sure. but uh, we in asia we are brought up in a very hierarchical manner nothing wrong with it that's our culture right we have to be conscious that it's our culture and we have to drive changes because the future doesn't work that way right so your observation is absolutely correct and uh, what you're saying as the need of gaur is also extremely right and that's precisely why that's going to be my approach today as well and thanks for bringing that up so Thank what you. happens is why i mean i'm also i'm also trying to look at uh, i've been doing a lot of uh, research around why we behave the way we behave right i i am a behavioral scientist i am a neuroscientist and putting all of this in my human capital management uh, role i came up with some very interesting observations one is that since the time we we learn to speak we learn to walk we are taught that listen to people who are older than you listen to your elders listen to your teachers do what they say be obedient okay and we carry the same lessons in the corporate world we go there and we say okay show me the organization chart and show me where i fit the moment i see where i am in the organization chart i i look upstairs who are the people who are in the boxes above me 
the moment i see those names in the boxes in my mind in my subconscious mind i'm telling myself oh yes i have to respect them i have to learn to obey them so my brain is constantly getting into the comfort zone of taking instructions and not taking decisions right now this is the mindset which we have to drive and change now why hr is very very critical here in changing this mindset is hr is like the circulatory system in any organization whatever you feed into that organization is carried by the blood vessels to every organ in the body right in an organization whatever you feed into it is carried by hr to every person every employee so hr is like the blood stream so if we feed toxins in our processes in the way things work we are actually circulating a toxic culture okay so when we look at these practices we are going to we are going to go back and forth on all these ideas right so if you look at your recruitment process the more the controls you put the more do's and don'ts you enforce you will find more of a counter force coming up the more you start opening up you will notice a lot more of good positive energy flowing in right so similarly it happens with every process so these are five crucial stages in an employee life cycle which we are going to touch upon and we are going to deliberate and reflect on right so let's look at recruitment uh, to start with okay so the very first stage in the employee life cycle recruitment what happened during the last couple of years when the pandemic struck three challenges really emerged while we were all grappling with the logistics and whether to work from anywhere from home work hybrid how are things going to change okay those are those are the tactical matters but fundamentally if you see the top three challenges which continue to emerge whether it is the pandemic or whether it is uh, any recession or whatever if you if you have to have an organization which is resilient to the challenges of the future you have to be able to find ways to navigate through these three one is identifying the best fit person for a particular position it goes without saying that it is extremely critical to identify the best fit now when we say best fit what we normally do is we look at the job description document we look at the shortlisted resume documents and we try and look at the match but is that the right thing to do that's what we're going to reflect on the second challenge is today's talent has actually become smarter you know every year year on year the talent in the market becomes smarter the talent in the organization also becomes smarter by the experience right candidates have started judging their offer letter based on what's in it for them it's not only salaries which are being compared there's a lot more okay people look at insurance benefits they look at how the incentive programs are designed they look at how vacation is dealt with uh they look at how open minded the organization's leadership is because the kind of opportunities that op that are opening up in the market are not only talking about money i'll give you an example there's an organization that i know of it's a startup which is started by uh, four very young uh, straight out of engineering college entrepreneurs and they 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 run a very very purposeful organization okay uh, they are actually in the space of improving literacy level among blind a very purpose driven organization so they have actually built a gadget which aids teaching the blind using braille it's an electronic gadget which aids teaching children using braille now how they landed up with this idea is when they visited schools for the blind in india they found that it was chaotic because the teacher to student ratio was something which was impossible and blind children when they can't see what's happening they tend to become noisy so one teacher is trying to scream and shout and teach braille to a class of 20 maybe even that's difficult 
because those children can't see, so they don't know social behavior. So what happens is students end up leaving, dropping out from school. So this group, they identified a product which they said they will design, which is an electronic gadget, which is sound enabled and the blind student can learn and become literate. So it is actually helping teachers to clone themselves. Now this organization did not have a challenge hiring people. Now I'm coming to the HR aspect. So I was talking to one employee of theirs and I asked him, what made you, uh, so I asked, I asked the founders actually, how did you apply, how did you your job postings for these positions? We didn't have to put any job postings. We only had to pay what our purpose is. People reached out for your organization, you hire us, right? So that is how, that one of the aspects of employer brand, how do you, not only because you're there or you give the best benefits, you can also be an employer of choice if you are able to articulate your purpose to the world very well, right? So identifying the best fit person for a particular position goes way beyond matching job descriptions and whatever is written on a resume. Because we all know, cross your heart and, and reflect, we all know neither a job description is an original document nor a resume is an original document. Those are all inspired or even copy pasted from elsewhere, right? We all know that there is no originality in both the documents. So identifying a best fit person is not as simple as matching these two documents. The second challenge, like I said, what's in it for them? Purpose driven. If you're able to articulate your organization as purpose driven, you're able to talk about the value proposition, you're actually telling what's in it for them. That becomes helpful for you to hire the best fit talent. The third factor is hiring speed, which is linked to both the company's cost and time. Speed of hiring, getting the right candidate at the right time and at the right cost. Agility in hiring, how flexible you are in accommodating uh, candidate requests, needs, emergencies, etc., so that you're able to get the right kind of person at the right time. Now, these are the three top three recruitment challenges that remain. Okay. I'll give you time to reflect and work on uh, in the next couple of. Let's look at some of the recruitment best practices and then we get on to a uh, practice session, right? So one of the uh, very, uh, what do you say, positive and a very uh, common best practice is asking your employees for reference. And that continues to remain a best practice because we want people in the company who are aligned. So if I am proud of my job and I'm going to be referring my friend to come on board, there's a very high probability that both of us could be retained. So asking your employees for referrals is a, is, a, is a good practice. But whom do you ask for referrals, right? The most common practice is we float an employee referral policy. And we say, this is the employee referral policy. And those of you who are interested, go ahead and apply and recommend or refer. But you'll have to think about, reflect about whether that is what we want to do when we want to go for referrals or we go to certain employees who are engaged, who have a higher level of engagement, and we ask them to refer. What is it that would motivate employees to refer? Is it the referral prize money or is it something else? So these are points that we are going to reflect upon on this best practice. It's easy for me to just give you a list of best practices, but that's not what we're going to do. We're going to reflect upon each of these. When sending messages, mention the candidate's accomplishments. So here, if you, when you're having, uh, when you're referring a candidate or when you are taking across a particular candidature to the next level as a talent acquisition team member, don't just forward the resume, mention the candidate's accomplishments. Become a champion of the candidate if you find somebody who's extremely suitable. What happens is 
I come across, I shortlist five CVs, which I think are the best. And I send it to my recruitment manager saying, boss, here are the five CVs that I've shortlisted. Uh, share it with the hiring manager and we can coordinate and schedule the interviews. Now, if I do this, I am only sending a subset of the hundreds of resumes that I have received for further action. But what is expected of a thorough HR professional going back to the oath we took, HR is an enabler. So here as a talent acquisition professional, I think it's important for us to enable decision making in the forward steps. So if I'm able to understand the resume, if I'm able to highlight what, what is great about this candidate and not only talk about the number of years of experience and uh, whatever are the, you know, the, the jargon words from the resume. If you're able to talk about certain other things, which is beyond the resume. If you're looking at the person's LinkedIn profile and you notice a lot of positive reinforcement activity in the post that the person has made, do make a mention of it. That talks about the behavior of the candidate. Resume may not, right? If you find candidates who are able to leverage their personal brand for the organization's value, talk about that when you recommend a candidate, right? So talk about the candidate's accomplishments beyond what is there in the resume. Keep your first message super brief. When you're talking to candidates, as well as when you're, when you're conveying any message which is likely to have a trailing conversation, keep your first message super brief. Here is where neuroscience really plays a role. If you write long emails, that could be the first and the last email. Trailing emails, if you want this to be a trailing email, if you want to keep the conversation going, keep the first message super brief and leave it with a connector which will take you to the next conversation, which will lead you to the next conversation. Arinima, uh, Ravi yeah. Desais. Yes. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so I have been a recruiter for a few years now. Mm. So I wanted to ask, how do we judge the genuineness of a candidate? Mm -hmm. uh, like we come across a lot of candidates who are interested for opportunities. Yes. But how do we exactly gauge the genuineness that they are actually looking for a job and the purpose of both the recruiter and the candidate is solved? Yeah, uh, definitely. So uh, when we're looking at interview process, I will be touching upon this uh, briefly, but now that you've asked this question, I will uh, go into it a little deeper. Uh, but just let's park this question for a few minutes. When we touch upon the interview tips, I'll tell you that it is getting sure. addressed. Yeah? Sure. But remind me if I'm not gone, not addressed it fully. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and when you're talking to your candidates, let them know what's in it for them. Okay, so what's in it for them is the employee value proposition. We often tell them that this is this job involves overseas assignments and stuff like that. But that is not enough. When you're saying what's in it for them, it's a lot deeper than that. Okay, so think about what are the creative ways in which you can talk about what's in it for them, apart from what they get paid in return for their service. So if you write anything about compensation shall be commensurate with your experience, uh, you will be paid as per industry standards, you will have overseas opportunities. Yeah, big deal. I know that I deserve all that. And therefore, I'm asking for more, right? So when you put things like this, you're leaving room for negotiating and asking for more. Instead, if you're able to creatively articulate about what's in it for them, okay, you will become a professional with so-and-so skills, okay? Uh, during your journey with us, you become a core member of tomorrow's path-breaking product. Now, this is what's in it for them. Now, these are very broad, high-level statements, but you can break it down further. So when you talk more about what's in it for them without using a list of perks and benefits, you're also conveying a message to the candidates that you see value in their candidature and you're not only looking at paying for a service. 
there's a big difference paying for a service you're treating me like a commodity value in my candidature you're treating me like a human being we all talk about bringing the human back into hr now this is one of the ways to do it. create a sense of urgency this is this reminds me of that very famous Sanjay, meme. Uh, yes sanjay uh, when we talk about uh, you know uh, this all uh, point number 4 Huh. then they talk about what is the documented uh, part of it or what they want to look for some constructive inputs hmm. the, uh, really it is going to happen that i am going to be uh, scaling up my role and all that kind because they believe that talent acquisition person is trying to convince me to join yes yes definitely definitely so here is a perception which has come over so many years which we have to try and break and i fully agree with you it is not easy you have to go step by step and why this doubt comes in a lot of candidates mind is give me everything in writing is because we have not been very transparent and clear somewhere in the past our uh, predecessors have probably not been very transparent and therefore this happens right so one way to get started on this is when you are doing your job posting itself okay you may you need not give designations there when you are doing your job posting you tell them that we are looking for people who will add this kind of value to this product that we are developing and by bringing your skills you are going to become a champion of this product right talk about that it's it's doable in startups okay when you do that you starting this your your communicating message in this tone right from the beginning and that makes a difference so when a conversation happens with the talent acquisition team the conversation is not restricted to the compensation and benefits okay and talent acquisition team needs to have a very deeper understanding of the business mission and vision and they have to lead the conversation in that direction instead of saying we are a company that has been in existence for so many years we are looking for somebody who will come and do the coding for us say things like we are a company which is looking at this kind of a future and we are looking at fresh talent to come and join us and help us to go towards that future you're you're saying you're giving information but you're giving information in a different perspective what is it that you're feeding the candidate with you're feeding the candidate with a lot of futuristic inputs you're feeding the candidate with a lot of positive words so the candidate is going to have this conversation with you in a positive manner if you are talking to the candidate like a, a salesman you he is also going to respond in the same way look at it like this we go to shops in in one shop when i walk in uh, the salesman completely ignores me he is busy attending so many other customers there is chaos i walk out feeling i am not valued for that salesman on the counter everybody is a is a customer or a prospective customer but if i am ignored i walk out or if, if he tells me this is what it is these are the prices i walk out i'm disinterested i walk into a shop where the shopkeeper actually pays attention to me tells me there's a lot of crowd give me a moment i'll be right back i suddenly feel wow this guy is great okay i feel attached because he saw me as a human being So it's exactly the same thing. While organizations talk, negotiate packages like a market bargain, organizations who are only talking positive and the purpose and why we want to have this conversation with you have a more engaging conversation. And people may not end up with no shows only by looking at the offers. What's in it for them is extremely important. And how do you do that is also creating a sense of urgency. We cannot have HR. telling i'll get back to you and never get back the whole world is making fun of us with that right there's this famous picture meme of a skeleton uh, saying this is what the candidate ha happens to a candidate when hr says we'll get back to you yeah how do we change that perception in people's minds is create a sense of urgency because please understand the talent acquisition role is actually a customer front ending role it's a marketing role the employer branding starts over there candidates are reading your job postings candidates are 
making assessments when you are sending an email to them they are making all those judgments about you as an employer so there you have to create a sense of urgency right build an excellent career page we all know career page is there but we don't focus too much on the aesthetics of it when i say aesthetics i don't mean the color combination of the page etc when i say aesthetics does your career page have a human touch to it does it say does it give instructions like if you have applied in the past do not apply or does it say that differently by saying if you have already reached out to us be sure that you, your resume is in our database and if you are the best fit fit person uh you would already be reached out to right so don't say things which don't really have any value what if some resumes come again find out ways in which you can deal with that instead of telling people do not submit if you have already submitted look at it like this if you say do not submit your resume if you have already done so and still like go ahead and submit it what happens your system doesn't stop right if there is a way that the person has created an account in your career page your system will say that thank you so much you already have an account here we have your uh, details with us and we shall definitely get back to you so build that human touch in your career page that's what i mean by an excellent career page and last but not the least engage with the candidate efficiently and effectively candidate engagement is not just being in touch with the candidate that is a minuscule part of candidate engagement a lot of people tell me that i keep writing to my candidate one mail goes from the talent acquisition desk every 15 days asking how are you and we are looking forward to your joining and these are the forms no here you are transacting information and this is an information which is required there's no humanness there but if you're talking of candidate engagement efficiently and effectively within about 15 days after you have made the offer you can make attempts to understand what are the interests the candidate has professional interests right now suppose i am a hr candidate and in 15 days after i have accepted the offer you have discovered that i can sketch well okay you probably uh, had conversations with me and you asked me about my hobbies right and you have also noticed that on facebook and instagram i am posting sketches so if you have already noticed that in a candidate who is critical to you and who you want to join if you are able to share with that person during the candidate pre joining engagement you are able to share things in your company which are related to that particular hobby or skill so we have events where we encourage our employees to do all the branding for the event so here are some past event brands branding that employees did themselves and we would love you you to bring your sketching skill your creative ideas into this you're not losing anything you're not giving out any company information you're anyway posting on linkedin no we did these events so it's anyway public information but bring something which is relevant to that individual and invite that person to be a part of it this is candidate pre joining engagement now you'll ask me we are onboarding 100 people in a week how do we do that yeah when you are a company of that size you can bring in technology ai enabled technology because a company of that size can definitely afford ai enabled technology platforms but if you are a smaller organization you can do it one on one so think about it right so these are some of the best practices uh, while you will be getting this slide deck for the reflection activity in case you uh, you if you're good at taking notes you can but you may even take screenshots as i share because you may want to refer back and forth as we do the reflections okay uh, and before we move on just want to tell you that uh, well at 12 5 we will take a 5 minute stretch break bio break okay 5 to 7 minutes yeah but when we get there i'll announce So now let's get into some practice. Let's get into some reflection, right? What I want you to do is, I want you to think of one particular position for which you want to 
higher and we are going to practice as many of these best practices as we can in whatever time we can right so think of one position one critical position as a practice today later on for the hrci credit participants you will get a workbook which you can use it ongoing as well right for that one position let's say the position you want is an hr executive for that one position i want you to write down what is the purpose of recruitment for you okay so why what is the purpose of recruitment irrespective of the position this can even be a generic statement why do you want to recruit a candidate one example here is recruit employees that are a cultural fit for the organization and can be associated with the company for the long term in a mutually beneficial engagement this is a mission statement for recruitment so what i want you to do is write down your own mission statement for recruitment okay but please note this is a sample what you are doing right now will be a sample but in your real world when you actually get down to writing the purpose it is best if you can sit with your leadership team by leadership team i mean even your hiring managers hods or founders whatever your company size may be sit with them and refine and get the statement the purpose of recruitment the recruitment mission statement refined by them what you are doing when you are sitting with your leadership and doing this refinement is you are getting them involved in writing this purpose so as a consequence what will happen is the leadership team believes that they are a part of this purpose and they will not throw open positions at you saying go ahead and get me candidates right isn't that a pain point for us as talent acquisition team that we are dumped with positions to be filled but if you are able to sit with the leadership team and identify the purpose of recruitment they become co-owners so take a moment i'll stay on mute for a moment take a moment and write down what is the purpose of recruitment for you you may want to refer to the oath statements you may want to refer to the moments of truth you may want to refer to the best practices feel free but write it down every one of you please write it down okay have you done that purpose of recruitment for you yes yeah i don't want everyone to read it out now this is purely for your personal consumption but yeah uh, this is where we reflect okay so feel free to write it i'm building a lot of psychological safety so feel free to write it in your own way but in your real world please have it validated by your leadership team give them the importance that you're involving them also in writing the mission statement for recruitment right moving on i want you to write down or list what are the principles or values that drive your recruitment process i'll give you some examples transparency could be one value uh teamwork could be another value uh value proposition itself could be a value so think of all these values 
or principles that drive your recruitment process. One value could be even busting bureaucracy. So when I say driving your recruitment process, it, it's not what goes in the job posting, but it is more about how the recruitment is done. If you look at it, the purpose is why recruitment is done. Here you're talking about how recruitment is done, right? So if recruitment is driven by busting bureaucracy, okay, if that is what you want to do, your wishful thinking, when you're writing, when you're building your recruitment process, it should not have any unnecessary approvals. That's contradictory to the how, correct? Suppose I say, I want a recruitment process which is very egalitarian and there'll be no bureaucracy in the process. And if I say that every single offer before release has to come to me, then I'm contradicting my value. Getting my point? So write down two or three values that drive your recruitment process. Uh, for whoever it is possible in your current organization, what are the values that are driving it? And what is it that you wish to do differently? Write down both. So if you're not from recruitment or even if you are handling recruitment, you will notice that it has, it might have a lot of approval process. So you can say that it is approvals driven. Nothing wrong. It has its merits. It must have had its relevance in some past. But we are talking about future resilient organizations. So currently you can say that these are the values that I drive it, but I wish to make it driven by these values. So write down both. I'm going to give you some time to think about it. Reflect on the current practices, current values that drive recruitment and write what you wish it has to be. Those of you who are watching the live stream on YouTube may also do the uh, practice exercise. What are the principles or values that drive your recruitment process currently? And what is it that you wish it to be? Be authentic and true to yourself when you write it. And uh, people here uh, on the uh, Zoom call, uh, I'll be happy if a couple of you are willing to read out directed on. Uh, there's nothing wrong in what's happening currently in your organization. That's absolutely fine. We're only trying to make our organizations and our HR processes future resilient. So we are looking at what we can do differently and better. So don't think that you are undermining the current processes. This is purely a reflection. So people on the Zoom call, this particular question, I would love to hear a, a few uh, 
few of you whatever you have written so you take another couple of minutes reflect well and write Okay, so who wants to volunteer to read out your as is principles that drive recruitment and to be principles? Who would want to volunteer? I see a lot of interesting comments, uh, uh, values. Yep. So, you know, I basically belong to, I've been into media and uh, advertising agency. So for me, throughout my career, I've been into talent acquisition team. And I feel that innovation is one thing, mm -hmm. which is must. Uh, uh, but have, have you been, uh, sorry, Tuntab, have you been able to reflect on what are the current values as you see it and be very, very honest about it? Uh, in terms of what what we are practicing right now in the yes. organization yes. yes so i think innovation is something which is because of the advertising agency and the digital and media is so happening you know huh. but innovation is one innovative. thing you have to be mm. innovative because mm. you know the uh, there are very uh, lack of uh, good candidates and everybody mm. wants good people mm. so innovation mm. is something which is uh, ongoing thing on a daily basis and definitely i think transparency because you know mm. you can't just tell lie and get people in and then you know because obviously if they go out uh, in six months time or in a month's year's time, mm. your value in the market is going to be ruined. So I think that mm. is also very important. Mm. So these two are the basic, you know, which I feel and definitely apart from that, um, uh, the timeliness mm. from the business timeliness. point of view, you know, we can't keep on innovating and getting good people and do be transparent. We have to fill the position on time you know, the uh, particular time period also because our business yeah. gets affected. So yeah. I think this three thing is very much important nowadays, mm -hmm. like from within okay. the industry I am in. So, yeah. okay. Excellent. Excellent. Anyone else wants to volunteer? What are the things that values that have currently drive your recruitment process and what do you want to change? Maybe I can add, uh, I'm Selection. Yes. Hi. Yes, Selection. So, um, it may sound out of the <laughs> question, but for me, after seeing the disparity between two continents uh, currently, what I can say is the simplicity, mm. you know, uh, that word makes it very common. It doesn't sound like a corporate jargon, but mm. it is relevant mm. because a lot of people think that, you know, okay, there has to be 10 processes uh, maintained. There has to be 10 rounds of interview or seven rounds of interview. Yes. And there's a lot of, I say, simplify your process because it's Absolutely. a two-way street. It's Absolutely. a two-way street. As much as you as an employer want to get the employee, the employee is also talking to Absolutely. 10 other different employers. Absolutely. This is not outside the question at all, Sulakshana. And it's again, once again, a brilliant point. I was actually I mean, when I say the word simplicity, people think why is she talking? I mean, what is she talking? You no, know? you're but right. You're right. You're absolutely right. And a lot of time, uh, simplicity is misconstrued as lack of process. Right. Yeah. So many a time they say that without a checklist, how will you ensure everything is done? And sometimes the mere existence of a checklist builds in uh, an, you know, a, a kind of complexity, which is not required. And I have a checklist. And if I don't tick all the boxes, I feel like I have missed something. Instead, 
you know, make it simple, like you say, bring in simplicity and talk about the value instead of a checklist. Then you're not limiting to the checklist. At the same time, you're not complicating by building a fear that the checklist is not done. Very well, very well said, Sulakshana. Any other points? Okay. No, just one uh, to add on to what I just said, the, the generation Z, like we all talk about, don't have the ability or the patience and the maturity to understand all this. You know, if you say Achha, this process has to be made, they may not be so uh, ingrained into the thought process that we emerged from, you know, mm. like, like we were from our generation, if I can say that. Mm. So for the future, especially when you talk about the release, resilience for the future, I think this is very important because don't look at it from only one perspective. Ah. Hai, you, know, you have to ah. do all the 10. No, ah. people don't ah. really. If you think the person has the ability and can deliver and if mm. you uh, can read that through them, mm. uh, when you have the conversations, just go ahead, do it. I mean, who cares what system it is as long as they're delivering what you're looking for. Exactly. Because if you look at this... I agree with you on this point. I just want to ask and you know, maybe I need a, a po- opinion from you and uh, you know, him. Mm. Uh, you know what happens is in a bigger organizations you know what they say that this is the process you have mm. to like you know have mm. to follow but they don't understand that for accounts for hr mm. for you know the creative people and you know mm. for the other everything is different mm. but they said that this is the checklist and you know this has been kind of forced to the people who are not at all I mean, how can you ask a copywriter or, you know, uh, uh, the person who is into finance department to judge somebody in terms of, um, you know, uh, the psychometric thing, you know, and they say, no, you have to write. How can they write? They can only say that, okay, this person is good in terms Hmm. of their accounting work or in terms of their writing work. Correct, correct, correct. But if you say that you have to write the characteristics of that, the person that, you know, how he's going to be and all those things, I think it's really not, not acceptable but in in bigger organization they are not ready to understand and not it's don't in big, yeah uh, so, so when you're drive trying to drive a change because now we are talking about the best practices we're talking about is all about change right we are changing from uh, a, a cano in uh, calm waters to a uh, river rafting on a turbulent water that change is happening and that is why we are de- redefining the best practices in large organizations word of caution do not try and do any kind of a change. Big bang. Uh, they will, there will be a lot more resistance to whatever you're doing and your best practices implementation will just, it'll just go off the window. It won't happen. In large organizations, it is always good to, to start small work on pilots. So pick up a group, whatever logical group, where they are ready to accept this change of working. So if you can pick up a particular department or a function or a group of people who are willing to work outside of check checklists, look at things a lot more qualitatively than putting everything in buckets and measuring quantity, try to drive a change there. So when you're talking about, uh, you know, recruitment checklist, instead of having a checklist that qualifies and, you know, has a checkbox, maybe you can have a checklist which is worded differently and which says that write down what are your what are your feelings about this candidate or things like that so think so drive the change where you can where you and there is an appetite for change so when you're changing your best practices from the traditional ones to the new age ones which is what we're talking about attempt it in a team that has the appetite for change it is too dangerous to push uh, in a team or an organization where there is no appetite for change that is a word of caution anyone else wants wants to talk about what is currently happening and how do you want to change it what do you want to change it as but remember the moments of truth as you're doing this as well I, I'm seeing a lot of comments here, but uh, anyone wants to talk about it, I'll be happy to hear. Chinma, you're talking of well-defined strategy, branding, database choices. Would love to hear your explanation on that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, why hmm. not? <laughs> yes. So basically, like, um, definitely a p- person who is into a recruitment process should have a well-defined strategy in order to uh, develop the market and also hmm. engulf the uh, resources out of it in order to place the right resource at the right place mm. 
Hmm. So if you are not having a well-defined strategy, we will not be able to do a, a proper recruitment process. Okay. And uh, we should also look into the market, like what kind of uh, competitive remuneration that is prevailing, and according mm-hmm. to that, to uh, place a indicative uh, salary range. So that according to the salary range, we can uh, directly go on to the uh, candidates and we can pitch them about the perks and benefits along with the joining bonus or mm-hmm. the other things that are related to the compensation. Mm-hmm. And basically coming down to technologies, yeah, every organization has a different kind of technology that they are into. But uh, it also depends apart from uh, the first step that you have mentioned, ma'am, as the uh, referral that we used to take. Apart Hmm. from what are the other sources of recruitment that also we can get into so Hmm. that we can hire the best candidate for the best fit. Hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Great. So... uh, you know, we, I'm, I'm happy to hear others as well, but, uh, you know, so that we finish all the topics on time, I'm just moving on, but anyone can feel free to interrupt and say, so we all, all whoever I heard now did speak about uh, a lot of these nice sounding words, right, that we want to have a recruitment strategy, our recruitment process is driven by a strategy, we look at the employer brand, we look at the process, we try to show value, all of that, but I want to again bring your attention back to the moments of truth. When you're defining your recruitment process, when you are defining the how of recruitment, please remember these moments of truth and they have to reflect in whatever you're doing so that you're consistent with your thoughts, words, and actions. And consistency in thoughts, words, and actions is what that builds your credibility as any professional. Okay? So when you're talking about the moment of truth of trust through transparency, Understand that your recruitment process has to be transparent and open to scrutiny by anybody at any time. Don't wait for an audit to happen. Make your process absolutely audit ready at any time. It has to be transparent. You can publish dashboards for everyone to view. Your dashboards need not be only for the management. Okay, the dashboards can be out there. It can be on your reception, on the display. How many candidates applied for the position? How many shortlisted? How many we have selected? So what you're doing is you're letting everybody in the organization know how difficult or how easy or how time consuming or what is the effort that goes into getting one candidate on board. That is something that we're all struggling sometimes to explain our own worth in what we do. So try and build transparency in your process so that people start trusting your process. Bring out this moment of truth when you're writing down what will drive your recruitment process. Try to bring the decision-making with accountability in your junior most recruiter. Try to develop this moment of truth when you're driving the recruitment process. Remove all the approval steps. Instead, build certain boundaries within which they can operate. So you may want to tell them that don't negotiate. Okay. While I give you a salary range, it doesn't mean that paying at a lower side of the range means you have saved money for the company. It doesn't mean that. What is important for you is to ensure that you bring in somebody so that and you make a package so that we get value for money. So try to drive in how salary is fixed rather than giving just a salary range. When you give a range, what happens is if you don't explain why the range is, the person who is using that range to make an offer will feel, if I pay less, I can show that as cost saving. Believe me, that does not save any cost. For all you know, you might be bringing in a candidate and that candidate comes on board and sees that he is lowly paid and starts another issue for you. So ensure that salary decisions are made based on understanding of the role and the weight of that role. If you have done a job evaluation exercise, share that with your junior most recruiter when that person makes a draft salary offer. Get your recruitment team to validate each other's offer and approve each other's offer. 
everything need not come to the recruitment manager for approval so that is how you are building decision making ability in your teams try to bring that moment of truth measure only what that matters in recruitment it is a super important metric i once had a recruitment team reporting into me who felt very happy when they had 300 positions to fill and i told them go back and see check with the hr operations team what is the headcount growth of the organization the headcount growth has been stagnant for the last 3 and a half years which means if you are hiring 300 people if there is a need to hire 300 people with no projected increase in the headcount it means 300 people are getting replaced which means your attrition is high now go back and check which are those positions for which you have to replace people with and which are those people who have left do some analysis around that so measure only what that matters if you are measuring number of positions filled you are probably not checking the health of the organization if you are able to measure the number of uh, new positions and compare it with number of existing replacement positions you will know really where you stand so please develop the habit of the correct usage of correct metrics in recruitment build agility in your team okay your recruitment team members who are front ending with the candidate should be able to make modifications in the offer and close it give them the freedom to do it equip them with all the necessary information and make them accountable for the decisions that they do if they introduce a buying of notice period let them know before they do that is to which are those candidates where a notice period can be bought up to what extent not in terms of numbers but in terms of consequences don't tell them that you can buy the notice period if it is up to so many rupees no tell them about the consequences when you take a decision of buying notice period what are the consequences that can happen you might be putting the previous employer in a difficult situation as an hr professional do you think it is within your ethics to do that so don't tell them buying notice period is okay tell them make a choice depending on whether it is okay to do that so what they will do is they will go and find out with the hiring manager whether it is really important to buy the notice period or is there a way that we can sustain to so make them think about the consequences it is okay a little bit to do all this but then you should do it mindfully mindfulness is important right drinking aerated drinks is injurious to health it's not good in the long run drink mindfully it's okay once in a while you need a little bit of soda which is fine but don't drink that instead of water so don't say buying notice period is okay for everybody that becomes water but do it mindfully when you do it mindfully and help them take those mindful decisions you're actually building agility in your teams and when you do that when you do all of this the fifth moment of truth is a bonus which you get you don't have to do anything you will notice innovation happening people will start thinking creatively because you're telling them about the consequence you're not telling them what to do and you're not giving them a free hand either okay shall we move on let me map i have a question here yes uh my point is that the recruiter do his best or she do his or her best to get a person on place but the internal culture of an organization becomes so that he is she is not able to retain and employ and it becomes like in out in out mm. so what is now what what a recruiter has to do in this kind of a because uh, she is doing her yeah, best so if, to get so when you look at your early exits your infancy attrition what we talk about uh you know so you have to do some ground work before you come to the solution to this this question that you asked the ground work is this look at your employee turn uh, turnout data okay look, i mean your employee turnaround data look at your uh, infancy attrition in particular people who have left within 6 months look at their exit interviews uh, forms immediately whatever is there okay also you have to refine your exit interview process because it's not as simple as asking people 
why are you leaving and tick one of the reasons it's not that it's more about finding out really why people left and you will realize that there could be reasons where there was an expectation mismatch about the role about uh the boss about the team about the location whatever there could have been an expectation mismatch i'm not saying misinformation but there was an expectation as a candidate i did not ask you i did not tell you that and therefore you did not clarify i realized it only when i came it happens and which made me frustrated and i left so an expectation mismatch could be on things not necessarily about the remuneration package but a whole lot of other softer behavioral areas find out what that is when you start making a list of all such expectation mismatch reasons you will be able to build what you what what i call as a script for recruitment talking to candidates and when as a as a over a period of time let's say over a period of 6 months to 1 year when that script keeps improving you will notice that what is communicated is very transparent and clear about what is the reality you won't be showing heaven to a candidate and then hiring the candidate into hell that won't happen if you start refining on this a lot of times the exit or the attrition statistics as well as the reasons the real reasons for premature attrition is not shared with the recruitment team if that is what it is please go back and ask your hr operations team hr mis team to share that with you ask questions about why this premature exit is happening don't take it for granted that premature exit is happening and therefore i have work to do to hire you're actually being counterproductive to the organization's objective right so if culture is the problem on the one hand you have to tell the appropriate people to fix the culture citing them that your role becomes complicated because you have to keep on hiring for the same position now this will happen only when you are very clear and transparent about these challenges yeah but when you do so start with looking at your attrition data Ma'am, and you find my point way. point here is Hmm. if a recruiter has to be in connect with the candidate who is now an employee of the organization for next one or two months hmm. or the role finishes just by selecting a candidate and let the operation Beautiful team for a full question the role definitely does not finish after selecting the candidate the recruiter is the face of the organization for a time much longer than that when we are looking at onboarding i am going to actually touch upon this uh, you you actually taken the suspense of that onboarding piece but when we go there i will t- i'll tell you that yeah Ma'am, so can i you... ask you one thing please yes. uh, so what happens is because i worked at a startup also in a bigger organization also so in bigger organization definitely as i said that there are long long processes so you mm. can't just throw somebody mm. out like this you know yes. but yes. in a smaller organization when you work directly with the founders what mm. happens is no matter how you you know at what length you go and make them understand the kind of you know that we can't take the decision mm. just ask somebody to go like that mm. first mm. of all my thing is like when somebody some business person says that hire him you know mm. Mm. we hire because definitely mm. when business says okay uh, that person mm. is okay in terms of his skills and we are also okay with the person you know mm. people mm. skill mm. but then six, within 6 months the same person mm. is saying it's not working out So I am sure it is not just employee, uh, you know, yeah. uh, uh, fault. Yes. Here I kind kind of you know feel that three months or two months or six months is too lesser time mm. for somebody to adjust in the culture. You have to see. I mean, if that person is not performing mm. at all, there mm. is some. I can understand employee's fault, mm. but yeah. I think there is some fault of manager also. That definitely, you did definitely. not able to give that kind of, um, you know, training yes, exactly, and time. Exactly, to, you can't expect somebody Arigi to come ji. from the other organization. Exactly. So, so uh, let me let me quickly jump into what the slide right now that's showing you is talking about. Define the process. Who does what? Why did I put it here? If recruitment is was, was only an HR role, I don't it need this not. slide here, right? No, so, it is not. Yeah, Sulakshana, you're saying something. <laughs> 
I'm saying to what just Pallavi asked or what you're yeah. referring to, who does yeah. what. I think yeah. when recruitment, the requisition is raised, I think mm. it is everybody who's involved in the process. Like yeah. it could yeah. be an HR talent acquisition recruiter or a mm. sourcer to mm. the VP of the operations or the LOB or the business exactly. unit. Exactly. That you, everybody exactly. has to be involved as to what you're looking. Okay, TK, you need a Java expert. Everybody a, has a skin in the game when it comes exactly. to getting a candidate. It is not. That's exactly why I'm, the slide is up here. After you have done with why of the recruitment and how, when you come to the what, you have to actually write down who does what. Now, this is a, you might feel this is a bit of an effort, but unless we get into this kind of detailing, no matter whatever theory we read about best practices, it won't happen. So this is a one-time effort. After that, it becomes normal practice, but go back and do it. And you get the heavy workbook, you will keep doing it repeatedly. Who does what? You're like Sulakshana rightly pointed out. When you're for hiring every single position, there is a list of people who have to do different activities. It goes right up to the person, the hiring manager, who's the person who requested this role. It goes even higher. It may in some small organizations, it may even go up to the MD or the founder or whoever. Person articulate. That person has to say why we need this position to be filled. That person has to say what this role means to us. Now, when you get that vision from that person, you're actually involving that person in this entire exercise. He need not take candidate interviews. The founder need not take the candidate interviews. But the founder definitely needs to know why certain positions exist in the organization, why certain value is given to them, so that if he has a he or she has a contrary view to it, it can be articulated. The hiring manager is responsible for getting the selecting the right candidate. So if there is an infancy attrition, it is not HR's fault alone. It is not the hiring manager's fault alone. It is a collective failure of all those people who came in this who does what. Right? And therefore. It's, it is a process which requires high amount of collaboration and coordination. So articulate who does what, who writes the job description. Do not pick up a standard job description from somewhere. Get the hiring manager to write down. You, he may not write it in beautiful, nice, jargonized way, but ask the uh, hiring manager, what is it that you want? Please document it for me, write it for me so that I get the right kind of candidate. So don't look for keywords, but look for qualitative information in, in what. So when, when, a, when a hiring manager not just raises a request, but says, I'm looking for the following things. I'm look And so it's, again, for the following things is not just a list of skills, but what kind of flavor this person would bring to the team. Okay. Uh, it could be things like I'm hiring this position for prospective clients in the Middle East. And therefore, I would love to have somebody who understands Middle East culture. How many job descriptions really talk about that? It doesn't, right? So you end up getting somebody who will work only in inter-standard time. And you want this person to deliver to a client who's in the Middle East. And therefore, two and a half hours of extra working in the evening becomes a challenge. And that person says, I was not told about this, right? We don't, we don't think about these consequences. And therefore, I said, if you start with what were the reasons for infancy attrition, when you're talking of expectation mismatch, small things like this will emerge. And if you're able to build those elements into your job description, you're actually writing real job descriptions for your company rather than picking it up from anywhere. Yeah, this was just an example, right? But who does what is very important, like Sulakshna said, everybody in the organization who on whom this particular role depends who is a uh, who on you know where there is a consequence of this particular role being filled is actually a part of this recruitment process and has to be given a role okay Ariniji, i have a question here yes to everybody <laughs> Uh, how many of us, like Pallavi just asked us, that mm. you know the operation says go ahead and hire him because he feels like a right fit? Mm. How many of us, as an HR, has have rejected the candidate once the ops have cleared? Because I have been many a times bold in that perspective. But is that is that something that usually people do, or is that something that we should be doing? Is my question. Anyone wants to answer before I do? May I? Hmm. May Anusha here? So yeah, there is a similar situation like what uh, uh, 
the other person sorry i couldn't get her name so see it is it was also a, a kind of ops referral and there was technical mm. clearance and everything got mm. over mm. but during the uh, hr round like when well, mm. i i we we see certain behavioral attitudes mm. alignment to the culture mm. and i i somewhere felt that this person would not be a right fit for the role mm. and uh, it was a tough decision to you know to speak against the hiring managers or hods or whatever mm. Mm. but Uh, i stood on the decision and i conveyed mm. this person will not be a right fit mm. of course there was uh, you know the company politics and all these things mm. were existing mm. but trust me uh, the managing director was on my side so if he could able to uh, point it out like why it is this way i believe that you no know, we can always bring a quality candidates to the organization so this happened at my scenario so please as a recruiter i strongly feel like no it is not just the technical skill as uh, uh, harini uh, from the beginning uh, has been trying to impact us that hr is a decision maker so we will exactly. have to strongly believe yeah yeah so yeah. but there are ways to do it and and good question uh, so lakshana and valid answer also anush i just want to build on that before i move to praveen just want to build on that is it's not very easy to resist or to counter somebody else's recommendation so whether it is a hiring i'm not i'm not putting the hiring manager at a higher pedestal than hr i'm only saying that we are all equal stakeholders in this entire decision making have an adult adult conversations one of my favorite uh, when it comes to interpersonal interactions uh, i definitely go by uh, the transaction analysis theory if you get into a child ego state uh, those of you who don't know transactional analysis it's a very simple theory uh, you can understand as i speak but it was uh, brought out by eric burn very simple theory there are three ego states in which we all operate at all times whether it is uh, at work or at home whenever you are interacting with uh, another human being there are three ego states uh, there's a parent ego state there is a child ego state and there is an adult ego state and always there is an equilibrium between the two people who are transacting transaction is the conversation that's happening i play in a child ego state i automatically force the other person to operate in a parent ego state and vice versa so what happens is when i crave complain get into a comfort zone uh, wait for instructions these are all indications of playing in a child ego state when i do that i am allowing the other person to get into a parent ego state and give me instructions uh fire me shout at me uh you know th- and give me uh, instructions rather than giving me a vision so that equilibrium will not bring out the best decisions however if you operate consciously in an adult ego state wherein you are not cribbing complaining or finding fault but you are only citing your observations about what is right about this candidate and from your perspective what you think is wrong so please bring in your hr uh, hat to it and say that hr people are trained to be behavioral analysts okay some of us may be behavioral specialists but we can definitely analyze behavior we are very strong in going by by our intuition we validate it with a lot of data and wearing my behavioral scientist hat i can tell you that these are the challenges that i observed and these could be the consequences how would we want to deal with this particular candidate such conversations are possible if we get into a fight mode that's where we start operating in a parent ego state and then we either have the hiring manager in either a, as a rebellious child or a submissive child right invariably hiring managers feel that they are superior to hr so they become rebellious child and they say do what i say i know this guy from my previous organization get this person but less rest of it i'll manage and many a time becomes a wrong decision also so it's very important for you to be very consciously operating in an adult eco state have an adult to adult conversation and come out with a consensus in the decision now when there is a consensus in the decision if something goes wrong in the decision tomorrow without saying the other person also shows accountability it doesn't become a problem of blame game yeah. yeah it doesn't become a blame game absolutely pravin ji you want to say something uh yeah 
so uh, sometimes what happens like um, when we talk about gd right it should be very crisp and clear concise kind of mm. but now it is what i have seen in lot of companies they just try to make a uh, not try to they just make a wish list of that right so each and everything like starting from recruitment to um, onboarding then analytics and compan then then and you know training everything so they prepare a kind of wish list of on that yes yes and when you when you go back and try to because i have said this thing in the uh, you know the previous one and when you go back to them and ask them to just crisp and concise a, what you are looking for exactly as a business leader then then they uh, you know get into firstly they are not ready to prepare right mm. first of all because this is the job of hr mm. uh, this is the first thing but when you push them ki no uh, you you are the business leader or you are the process owner of that you better understand than uh, than an hr you prepare then they prepare the wish list of that mm. then again go back to them ki it will not work accordingly so either you have a fight or you will crib down right <laughs> because you cannot as a hr you cannot force the wish list on the social you media cannot or, or you cannot force you cannot force nobody can force and force always has a counter force uh, you have to yeah, create and wait right. yeah. uh-huh. so and you cannot post that uh, you know jd uh, two pages jd or one and a half pages jd or anywhere तो वो जो चैलेंज है उसको क्रिप करके वी हैव जस्ट कटेड शॉर्ट एंड यू यू बी मेड द ऑफर ऑफ समवन सो सो जस्ट फॉर वांट ऑफ टाइम आई एम जस्ट कटिंग यू शॉर्ट हियर बट आई गेट योर पॉइंट सो व्हाट आई एम ट्राइंग टू से इज व्हाटएवर वी डिड हियर नो टिल नाउ डिफाइनिंग द पर्पस ऑफ रिक्रूटमेंट इन शॉर्ट इफ वी आर एबल टू मेक दीस एज एलिमेंट्स ऑफ एवरी पोजीशन रिक्वायरमेंट दैट कम्स अप you remember in school we used to write these laboratory journals and we used to start with aim objective uh you know requirements and then you write the procedure okay and for every experiment we used to write the aim okay similarly one sentence if you are writing what is the purpose of this particular position at the recruitment i mean hiring manager to write that what is the purpose of this position yeah they will always say who has time to fill all your forms but ask them okay don't fill it but tell me what is the purpose of this role that you want to hire don't be judgmental about their answer but hear it from them it will help you to validate how important that position is it will help you to make a decision as to whether that position is really needed and all these insights will be helpful for you to make an argument when you have to get into an argument right 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 it it may sound a little fuzzy but practice it it's very difficult to to fight against the hiring manager and we don't want to end up fighting we want to end up with a constructive solution exactly and we we know that people bring in friends from previous companies etc uh, the organization may not even need we come into such situations and many times hr is struggling to find a way to stop that but if we get into the practice of asking these insightful questions don't put them in a spot by saying fill this up for me ask them how would you define the purpose of this role it will help me to get the best candidate for you right you have to get into a conversation and as far as possible my personal feel is these conversations if they are kept agenda less unofficial they work better if you fix a meeting time and go you are actually building a power distance there try to keep it as an agenda less conversation get these insights and tell them i'm doing this to help you create a need in it for them rather than a force when you give them a template to fill you're kind of giving them putting a force on them whenever there is a force there will be a counter force that is law of nature okay so mm-hmm. if you force people there will be a counter force but if you create a need the counter need is only going to add to the need right so they're going to help you chai par charcha will make a difference in that <laughs> oh yeah yes definitely chai par charcha is a, it's a it's a fantastic concept all agenda less conversations bring out more useful insights than meetings with agenda and yeah. that's there's a, there's a lot of theory behind it there's a lot of neuroscience theory behind it but for some other time yeah. right so we will run short of time otherwise so i think here let's take yeah so let me just quickly go through 
one or two more slides on the same topic of recruit and then take a break before we get into onboarding so when you are so all those things that i said convert them into templates which are not rigid templates but are flexible ones uh, you can tell them that you don't not have to fill everything but you definitely like to know what is the position you want to fill describe it rather than calling it by a designation now why i'm saying that is the person with the same designation could be performing an completely different role in another organization right so it's important for us to clearly identify what is it that we are looking for a designation or the role that the incumbent is going to play in your organization so if you're saying hiring assistant manager hr and if you're looking for assistant manager hr as a designation you will find people who are currently playing the role of uh an hr executive and is aspiring to, to become an assistant manager but instead of that if you say that i am looking at an individual who is going to drive these hr sub processes and will be working closely assisting the uh, hr manager i'm not saying the designation at all i'm keeping the field open to getting talent who is currently an assistant manager somewhere currently maybe even a manager somewhere currently a fresher whatever i'm keeping that open and depending on the merit of that candidate the value that candidate will add to the organization i am open to giving a different designation this solves a problem you know one problem that we have is he's currently assistant manager in that organization ours is a bigger organization therefore he has applied but he's looking for a change in designation hota hai na we face that problem and we create fancy designations deputy manager senior assistant manager just because we want to show that person that this is a career growth from your previous organization instead if you are looking at the person for his merit the value that he brings in you are flexible to change the designation or given appropriate designation you are not confined by his current designation so think about that describe the purpose of the role like i said you know it like the aim of the experiments in the laboratory journal describe the purpose of the role why does this role exist exist how is it going to be important in the business and avoid writing the task list of a job description instead of saying this role has to perform these tasks say what will be the expected outcome of the role so instead of saying a quality manager who is well versed with quality audits understands uh Uh, you know safety and environment and all of that you say that a quality manager ensure that we move to a level of whatever quality certification in the industry a quality manager is somebody who will drive new concepts in quality management say talk about that as a job description what will be the outcomes you will measure in terms of the task lists your job uh, posting should talk about value proposition what's in it for me instead of only are uh, writing what we expect from you we expect you to have this qualification and so many years of experience instead of that we would love to give you uh, a place where you can explore your creativity or your ability that you bring in and list the ability there but show the person what's in it for them instead of to come with this ability and these skills you say that we wish to give you a space to demonstrate those skills now each of these words in your job description or job posting or advertisement it resonates differently in the human brain there is neuroscience here when i read words like this saying i am here to provide an opportunity to you versus i am inviting you because you have these skills i look at it very differently i am looking at you as an employer providing me an opportunity that completely tones down my need to negotiate so think about it when you write your job descriptions how does one apply when you're writing your application process how do you want the process to be look at the candidate experience in all of that okay so i'm leaving this slide on reflect on this whoever is not stepping out for a bio break uh, stretch break uh, and i'm muting my mic and going off video and it's 12 or 5 it's yeah 12 or 5 by my clock We'll be back at twelve fifteen, ten minutes break. Once you're back, uh, just put in the chat that I'm back, so that I know you're back. 
uh, and whoever wants to keep your video on once you're back, it'll be good because sharp at 12.15, we will resume, right? So I'm leaving this on. Don't leave the meeting. Stay on the meeting. Just go on mute and off video.
Okay, welcome back everyone and let's resume because we have a lot to catch up in the next two hours, less than two hours now. Okay. So thanks for letting me know those of you are back and uh, whoever wants to turn on your video cameras, feel free to do so. It will only make me feel better. So I want to talk about a few interview tips for effectiveness. A lot of time is getting spent on the recruit piece because that's a very crucial uh, employee lifecycle process touch point. And uh, it has almost all the moments of truth really coming up very starkly. And it has consequences that goes right through the employee lifecycle and therefore spending more time on that. Interview tips for effectiveness is do not ask to walk through the resume. Look at it from the candidate's perspective. Anybody who tells me, walk me through your resume or tell me about yourself, uh, I would actually say that I've already submitted my resume two weeks ago, based on which you have uh, invited me for this interview. Why would I want to say it? It's, it's very frustrating for me to do things that are repetitive. And that's true for any candidate. So do not ask to walk through the resume. If you really want about the candidate's qualifications and experience and kind of experience and whatever reference you want to check, uh, cross-check with LinkedIn profile, whatever, do that as a pre-work and don't use it to waste time during the interview. Do not ask for strengths and weaknesses. That question is the most inauthentic response that you can get because people normally come very well prepared with strengths and weaknesses. So instead of asking upfront about strengths and weaknesses, Use your interview skills and find out. Do not ask what you're expected to find out. You don't need MBA qualified recruiters to conduct interviews if they have to ask questions straightforward. You know, give merit to the qualification that an MBA HR does before coming on board and let that person learn the art of finding out, interviewing is not asking, it is viewing, which means the interviewer has to find out and not ask. So these are very important don'ts in an interview process. And if you want to make your interviews effective, look at the do's. When you want to really find out about the person's capability, ask the person to speak about his or her moments of pride in the previous experience. Ask the person to speak about his or her moments of loss. With these two questions, you can find out strengths and weaknesses. You can find out a lot of things about the person, the person behind the name and the face. Now, in remote hiring, we have a lot of proxy candidates who give the interviews and then ultimately somebody else joins. That has been a very funny challenge. But when you start doing interviews in this process, the likelihood of mishaps of that kind get minimized to a great extent. Because when I talk about my moment of pride, I cannot become an imposter for somebody and talk about a moment of pride. I can very easily become an imposter for somebody and walk through their resume. Right? So talk about mom asking about moment of pride, moment of loss. And if a person is very comfortable talking about this moment of loss, where things went wrong, that helps in identifying the genuinity or authenticity of the candidate. Uh, there was a question, I think, from Sanjay who asked about how do we ensure that candidates are genuine? Use the STAR technique. Ask them to talk about their moments of loss. If they are very upfront and we are, they're very comfortable talking about what they did not do well, you know that the candidate is genuine. And these questions should be related to the prospective role you have in mind and may be drawn from their past experience. So don't go only by past experience because there also the candidate can build up stories, but give a situation from the prospective role that you want to hire the person for and ask about how will you behave in this situation and talk about a moment of glory and a moment of loss. Or if there is something that you don't do well, how will you manage to mitigate that loss? These are all ways to find out how genuine the person is. Have I answered that question, uh, Sanjayji? Okay, so let's move yes, on yes. to, yeah, so let's move on to onboarding. 
Okay, let's first understand what onboarding is. So here is a, another just question. Quickly which... to add on to what you're saying, Harini ji, I think yeah. we just minutes ago spoke about uh, employee engagement, yes. and you rightly oh, said God. that it starts from okay. the recruitment time. No. Mm. This is when you reflect on the resume, when you already understand what's happening there. I think that's when the employee also feels connected. That okay, he or she knows what she's talking about. You know, mm. she's mm. actually gone through my profile, so hence she doesn't ask me questions which are redundant. Mm. And that mm. is where the connection starts. And Absolutely, happens, you know? Absolutely. And they feel valued. It yeah, it eliminates the frustration, and many a time that frustration is evident on the candidate's face. Yeah. You no, know, right. That way. But you know, but it's it's beautiful to see how we have slipped into that trap ourselves. at some point for want of time we might have started off a conversation like that tell me about yourself that particular situation i did not have time to do a pre work and i did it but then i realized it is so comfortable now i don't have to do any pre work before the interview i can walk into the interview room and say tell me about yourself but look at it from the candidate's perspective it is frustrating to talk about information that i've already given no, right. Yeah, and and also for us because we are wasting productive time into yes. understanding more yeah, meaningful that. work yeah. that they've done. Exactly, exactly. Into asking that's strange. very menial. So, fifteen minute of a behavioral event interviewing is far more insightful and productive than forty five minutes of traditional interview. Right. So, move into behavioral mm-hmm. event interviewing. Behavioral events are talking, asking the person about moments of pride, moments of loss. what you would do differently today if you have to relive that moment of loss it tells you about the person's agile mindset it tells you about the person's willingness to reflect and change on the mistakes that he or she has committed it tells you a whole lot of things about the behavior about that person beyond the name and the face and those insights have to be noted down as interview comments and not things like good language skills good teamwork but how this question on a situation demonstrated teamwork of this person is a far more insightful finding than just stating he was he displayed teamwork padmi ma yeah what are the three skills a recruiter require uh one is empathy definitely no, empathy no technical skills technical skills behavioral event interviewing of course no doubt about it you have to be able to to come up with behaviors which you want to assess by looking at situations which are in the potential role the role which means understanding of the role not only from the words but what does that role require as an outcome that level of depth of understanding is required that's one skill the second skill is to is to be able to ask relevant questions okay and the third skill is to be able to articulate the insights that you get from those conversations these are the top three skills so if you really want to build these three skills in a recruiter you have to do a customized program training program for the recruiter your your off the shelf training programs uh, for recruitment doesn't help these are the top three skills under in depth understanding of the role in order to build scenarios for behavioral event interviews second thing second thing is to ask probing questions and the third thing is to articulate your findings insightful findings then it becomes very easy for you to have an adult to adult conversation with a hiring manager when you have a counter to his viewpoint when it comes to a selection conflict yep so let's move on to onboarding understanding onboarding uh, here is there another question which somebody asked is, is coming up onboarding is the first step in relation building okay it is a first step and it is a very important step it is a transition from a candidate to an employee and during that transition you are actually giving the person uh, a piece of your organization's value uh, values and the systems and the processes the onboarding is not only a documentation process yeah maheshwari want to say something Harini, just let just a little curious. Hmm. Uh, you know, uh, ideally, uh, in an organization, when somebody experience join in, maybe say ten to fifteen of the experience, hmm. how long one should have the onboarding process? What should be the duration like? And what key aspects to be taken care of? Okay, onboarding process is not necessarily a very short process. It does not say that. if the person is experienced onboarding can be done in a very short period it does not mean that freshers need longer time of onboarding onboarding depends on the role that you are getting the person in for 
if you are hiring a new ceo of a large complex organization onboarding can last up to 12 months because the complexity and the depth and the consequences of that role the decisions that that role takes can be very very high So onboarding can be as long as that. Now hiring a CEO, an experienced CEO for a large organization, onboarding can be a twelve-month-long process even. So it depends on more on the role that the person is playing and the consequences of decision making in that role. Right. So in an onboarding process, the employee understands their roles and responsibilities. onboarding process also helps and enables the employee to settle so onboarding is not only for getting the person on board but it goes beyond that it helps the person settle down and therefore a senior person coming in for a senior role might require a longer onboarding process onboarding helps candidates to become employees that is interact with their managers and teammates so that they become a part of the team it also definitely without saying it uh, helps in understanding company's policy systems and protocols that is a tactical part of it onboarding is not only an hr's role so when you are writing the onboarding process when you are writing who does what please ensure that you are getting management and other colleagues involved too in onboarding whenever i onboarded anybody in my organization even if it was somebody from the engineering team i would ask that person to spend 15 minutes with a designated onboarding support from the finance team as well and understand the finance processes of this organization you know what happens in that when i get fully onboarded into the role touching cutting across various functions which may not even be directly related to my role i feel like i own the company it gives a bigger sense of engagement and it significantly reduces the blame i might even contribute with some fresh ideas to a department which is not related to my role at all believe me i got accounting processes improved by taking insights from new joinees during onboarding it helps a lot in organization development so if you're looking at onboarding as only as the documentation and getting people on board uh putting them into a buddy program etc that is a very small piece of onboarding onboarding happens to a much longer time so what does that mean for a recruiter no no near forward what what does it mean to a recruiter is that the recruiter's responsibility with a candidate doesn't stop when the candidate is joining on day 1 a recruiter's responsibility goes on beyond that a recruiter a very active participant in the entire onboarding process when when the when the new employee has doubts about understanding and has clarifications to make about what was spoken at the time of hiring you have to provide that person the visibility of the recruiter so that those conversations happen automatically the recruiter cannot hand over the candidate and the file joining file to an hr generalist and say you take over from here right when you are doing a relay race there are moments of overlap when two people are holding the baton which is relayed you cannot throw the baton to the next person then the baton will fall down and you get disqualified from the race it's exactly the same analogy here now because this is a longer engagement and not a few minutes of the relay race you hold the the employee new employee together for a much longer time depending on the complexity of the organization depending on the complexity of the role depending on the the consequences of of behaviors in that role the onboarding overlap between the recruiter and the other hr person who's taking over can be much longer okay so let's move on so this with this fundamental understanding of onboarding let's move on to practice uh, again what i want you to do is what is the purpose of onboarding for you write the onboarding mission statement for yourself for your organization an example could be onboarding is uh, you know our mission is to onboard every employee so that in a way that he or she feels part of 
the business for a longer duration that could be an example another example could be the mission of onboarding for us is to get engaged employees from day one whatever it may be these are a couple of examples but take a moment and write down the purpose or your onboarding mission statement i'll give you a minute please write down the purpose or the mission statement of your onboarding process uh, even those people who are watching the youtube live streaming please make a note of this you are actually going to practice this as the workbook uh, you can do it in a much detailed manner in your workplace but take a minute now and write it down your minute starts now Okay, your minute is over. Uh, hopefully, you have written the mission statement for onboarding. You can keep on refining it, but make it a practice to write these mission statements and put it up somewhere so that it keeps working on your subconscious mind. Um, now, take a moment and write what are the principles and values that drive your onboarding process. Think of the the moments of truth and and the oaths that we took. and try and write the principles and values that drive your onboarding process uh, definitely i think uh, i mean it will be a good idea for you to reflect on your current onboarding process vis-a-vis -vis what you want to do differently you will notice that there is a difference because currently typical onboarding processes are limited to the first day day 1 week 1 and the most month 1 but you must write down that what you wish your onboarding process to be the principle that you wish it to be is to help the person perform best potential that has to be a value that will drive your onboarding process for the future to make your organization future resilient and i'm sure that is not there in most organizations so please write reflect and write honestly true to yourself what are the principles that drive your current onboarding process and what are the principles that you want your onboarding process to be this question i want to hear two or three voices i want you to speak up if you can share right take a couple of minutes i'll give you a couple of minutes to reflect and write
Yeah, Ratna Sureka, do you want to say something? Yeah, hi. I actually thought uh, of waiting for two minutes to complete. Yeah, yeah. I was about yeah. to unmute and say who wants to speak. Yes, you have raised your hand, so. Yep. Okay. Well, you know, I am just going to try to put it in a very uh, layman's example. Uh, Beautiful. But, I love that simplicity. Yeah. So currently, uh, the onboarding process, uh, when it comes to HR office, it's a very comprehensive. Okay. Mm. So mm. it runs from uh, pre-joining until 90 days. And sometimes, depending on the role, it goes to uh, 180 days. Mm. Okay. And when I said, actually, it's... Um, HR department onboarding program. Mm. That means like, you know, we allot a buddy. Okay. Mm. And mm. then we keep interacting with the buddy and the employee. Mm. And uh, on a periodical basis, uh, some kind of uh, uh, informal and uh, formal meetings. Mm. And especially the reason why I said informal is it used to be very informal when uh, we were working together in the office environment. Mm. Now it has become a more formal because for everything I have to uh, you know, send a meeting invite. Okay. Huh, huh. So, so that's how it goes. Uh, mm. So, and we actually, you know, I encourage the team to, uh, you know, connect on the grounds, which you actually mentioned about understanding mm. the uh, passion and hobbies of the uh, mm. candidate. Okay. Mm. And then uh, keep the engagement coming from that point. Mm. Okay. So that is mm. one of the aspect in the pre-joining. Mm. And when it comes to onboarding, so we do in a very uh, detailed way in the sense, not in a hurry, even the uh, new hire training program also, it goes up to uh, three, four sessions every mm. week, maybe one hour. That's mm. all. We don't want mm. to, you know, uh, dump everything on the, you know, employee. Mm. And that's how it is done. Uh, mm. When it comes to explaining, you know, uh, what exactly the company is, Mm. And connecting them with the mm. role. Mm. Okay. Mm. So if you allow me, I'll take two more minutes to explain. Okay. Yeah. So for example, I'm working as a head HR for a ODC uh, of mm. a US based MNC. Okay. Mm. Mm. And the MNC background is manufacturing industry. Mm. And IT is a very small sector in that entire, uh, you know, organization. Mm. Okay. So when I am hiring the people in, uh, ODC, you know, mm. I'm getting the people from Accenture and Oracle and from that kind of companies. Mm. Okay, so for example, mm. I hired a candidate who is mm. into a uh, uh, Oracle e commerce mm. developer. Mm. I'm just giving you the role. Mm. So I actually wanted them to understand mm. how he is connected to the business. Mm. So he actually got the offer and he is very happy and blah, 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 everything is done. So mm. when I actually explain him in mm. a way that he understands his role, how it is connected to getting into the business, mm. is in a simple term, he will mm. be taking care of the e-commerce website of the company. Mm. Right? You know, mm. so that actually, as a developer with two to four years of experience, he mm. will not be understanding what kind of difference that he is going to make. Yes. Right? Yes. What kind of difference it is going to make. So yep. I used to tell them, you know, from the starting, the company history and what are the company business, various units, functions mm. and departments. Mm. And actually, what is the Hyderabad mm. ODC is uh, uh, supporting and mm. what are the functions that we are supporting across the globe. Mm. And and I actually, you know, it is cascaded down from the top to his role. Mm. And I used to leave it there, mm. asking him now. He has to tell me mm. how he thinks that his role is connected to mm. getting the business mm. and mm. achieving the business done. Mm. So he should take the pride when a quarterly sales is actually, you know, announced. Mm. And what is his contribution in that sales? Ah, so that's what. So in onboarding, you not only talk about the company processes, procedures, but you also show the individual as a part of the big picture. Exactly. And right? it takes time. So, yeah, yeah, it takes time. Exactly. So some roles, it, it can be done quickly. In some roles, it takes time because the role is complex. Yes. You won't be able to understand the consequences of their actions or behavior on the day one or month one. Or that's what. If 180 days, it could even take up to a year. Yes. For, for large organizations, for a CEO to settle down in that role, it takes a year. And even after the year, they feel it's a mistake, right? So the person was not able to be onboarded properly. Onboarding is completely letting that person 
take ownership and accountability of that role exactly if you if you are showing if you are imagining that your organization is like a movie poster your onboarding process should be able to show that particular actor in that character so yeah. that when you look at that poster you know whether this person is playing the uh, lead uh, hero role or a sidekick or a villain exactly the, when you look at the poster you know na because we now we have stereotype that certain actors are heroes and certain are villains <laughs> but suppose that was not there when you look at a movie poster you come to know that what role this person is going to play in this whole movie exactly and onboarding is as significant as that and therefore it can be longer if the role is senior and is very consequential for roles which are not consequential for example for a uh, front desk employee the consequences of decision making are very short right it, that person will either allow the visitor to enter or not that person will transfer a phone call or not and why so their onboarding process can be very small right but if that person is going to take accountability of who can meet whom at what times has to apply a lot of filters without taking instructions from somebody the onboarding process could be longer that person needs to understand the consequences of his or her actions exactly and i know in a way i see that explanation or explaining this kind of purpose of the role during the onboarding will also help yes, the employee definitely you know, to understand the purpose of his hiring yes exactly hiring. and therefore now you see why it is important to get the hiring managers write down the purpose of the role it came from you it yeah. has to be there so it's up to, in our own interest to make onboarding effective both i mean if onboarding is effective the hiring manager is also going to be benefited because this person is going to settle down quickly and therefore identifying the purpose of the role is very important you said it and it's it's hang on validation for me that it is making a lot of sense thank you so much and i do see a lot of very interesting comments coming up role expectation process owning building trust and confidence i must thank those participants who are uh, you know engaging through the chat window as well uh, you know ravi is very participative samir umesh keep this coming and i am reading it as i'm speaking as well right so thanks a lot ravi you want to say something yeah so uh, i have not done uh, you know vast thing on onboarding but uh, as to my understanding mm. that uh, engaging the um, uh, you know implies uh, with the cultural uh, aspect mm. uh, is one of the key thing which we can yes. uh, adopt in the pre onboarding uh, yes. process right? yes Uh, yes. sending them the you know whatsapp or uh, related to culture related to any event or something uh, that can be very uh, helpful the uh, second uh, give them the understanding about role mm. and business mm. so that uh, he can relate the role and his role and business and uh, fit uh, you know uh, feel comfortable and fit mm. himself how mm. to perform in mm. that uh, particular situation mm. then uh, the value should be like uh, it should be a very uh, in a manner that he can uh, feel he or she can feel the belongingness in the company mm, mm. then the transparency uh, should yes. be there yes so the, yes yes the trust the, they can develop that trust between the uh, em- company and the other part of the you know the different side of the em- employees they can uh, definitely so in the onboarding trust. go back to your moments of truth in your onboarding process you should be able to demonstrate trust through transparency so if your onboarding process says this is only information that will be given to you now and later on if you have questions you come back to me it does not demonstrate that much of transparency right Definitely. so look at how you are scripting your onboarding process and dis- try and discover these moments of truth in your onboarding process are you able to explain the role you means not hr i mean i'm saying define who does what and get the appropriate people but take ownership on that on that outcome of that onboarding will the person in his role in the organization that he's so excited about will he be able to take decisions with accountability of consequence is that happening you know you can ensure that moment of truth is getting in the role what is going to be measured is his inputs in the role is the task going to be measured or is the outcome going to be measured that also should be covered in the ongoing process itself in the onboarding process itself am i going to measure the number of hours you are sitting here is the attendance record important for me 
or is the outcome important for me right so if i focus on this is your swipe in time and swipe out time and three days if you come late there is going to be a half day leave cut instead of focusing on that if i say that you are expected to work so many hours a week and deliver outcome that will be measured in this manner right everybody knows attendance record is required for statutory compliance labor inspector aayega so we have to show the attendance register we all know that and we will do it but are you going to measure that is that going to be consequential and there can be an argument to this saying if we are too open about it people will misuse but look at it like this less than 3% of your population is likely to misuse so why do you want to penalize the 99.6% of your population yeah the uh, the other thing is we have to create the culture in the organization where uh, yes. the uh, you know uh, believe that cannot be misused yes and, and the, see if you are able to see don't tolerate any misuse misconduct very clearly so when you are not tolerating misconduct and when you are giving freedom you are actually giving freedom with responsibility right when you do both together you are actually setting up the culture of the future where everybody feels that he is part of the game accountability will be higher engagement will be higher the consequence you will see in the attrition coming down right yeah pre onboarding activities can be teaser of an upcoming movie yeah uh, brilliant i have seen companies doing that they show it like the person is part of a movie poster and people put that up on social media and that improves your employer brand in a way but a word of caution here is whatever you are doing as actions it has to be in synchronization with your organization values you cannot do something where thoughts words and actions are not in sync then it will fall apart we'll say something before you are an employee but when you come on board we will do something different that's too dangerous so you have to be very very synchronized in thoughts words and actions yeah great so uh, i want to move forward we will lose time otherwise okay so let's look at a few templates of onboarding by templates here i mean what all you have to keep as you design your onboarding process there are five distinct c's or distinct levels for very effective and successful onboarding the first one is compliance we do not have an escape from that you have to do whatever is statutorily required is an auditable process right so definitely compliance is something which you cannot compromise so if you have to have code of conduct signed all all mncs have that code of conduct non disclosure agreements uh, any other uh, you know legal documents that they need to sign you have to get it done that compliance is absolutely important uh there could be multi geography uh, requirements if you are a multinational company so all that you have to ensure so no no compromise on that the second c of onboarding is clarification leave ample scope for clarification invariably what happens is we do not tell people where they can reach out for clarifications we give one sided information we bombard them with information and we do not leave enough room yeah we might have an email address where it says if you have any query uh, drop in drop an email to this that doesn't help what is important is people should feel that those emails will be responded to so you have to have an active engagement on those platforms where you are letting them seek clarifications right so there has to be synchronization you have to mean what you say you have to say what you mean the third one is culture onboarding is the 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 exact place where you can demonstrate flavors of culture both formally and informally onboarding is the process where the person gets an
Hi, did we lose the audio? I haven't been able to hear Harini for the past couple of Yes, uh, same here, same here. Uh, even for me. Yeah, same here. Okay. Hi, is there someone available from the core HR team to check that? Hi, Harini. Sorry, I had a network glitch and I quickly changed my network. I'm back. So let me continue sharing my screen. Hope we haven't lost anyone. Looks like, okay. So let's look at uh, the, the third C. I was talking about the culture. So culture is something which a new joinee brings into the organization and an exiting employee leaves in the organization. So culture is something which does not go away when an employee leaves the organization, please remember that. So culture is extremely dynamic. It is something which is very fluid. So every time in an onboarding process, the more exposure to different components or elements of the organization that you give, the more people will be able to ingrain themselves in the culture or get a flavor of the culture. So culture is not something which is spoken in words saying we are an open culture, we have a first name culture. It's not limited to that. Are we able to demonstrate all of those flavors in the way the person is treated? If you say you're an open culture and if you have too many approvals in place, it's very contradictory. So if your ongoing process is showing them that there are many approvals rules you have to take, remove statements of open culture in your induction people, right? So culture is something which the person gets a flavor of or an experience of during the ongoing process. So all of that has to be properly designed. Connection. The onboarding process is the stage where the connection starts. A lot of interpersonal relationships are formed, networks are formed people start getting the feeling of belongingness and therefore building in a lot of informal steps in the onboarding process is key critical. It's not enough if you have a formal induction process. It's not enough if there is just a buddy. The buddy needs to be completely involved and engaged in the program and the buddy needs to know what is the outcome of the buddy engagement. The buddy programs also need to be measured. Talking of metrics, we invariably do not measure this, but effectiveness of buddy program is an important metric when it comes to an onboarding best practice. The fifth C is check back. Identify milestones. It can go as long as one year. And when you're doing that check back, ensure that the recruitment or the talent act position person who was involved in that candidate is there in those check back meetings. There will be a lot of missing links which the new employee would want to clarify on even after 60 days of joining. And those times it becomes very important if all people involved in getting that person on board is there in that meeting so that those clarifications are done then and there. Any delay it, it removes that sense of urgency in the way you work and then that can result in disengagement or slight lack of transparency. As you design your strategic employee onboarding process, keep the five C's in mind and definitely keep the five moments of truth also in mind as you define that. Ensure that you're building in metrics for measuring the buddy program effectiveness. The buddy program is not just a feel good thing. It has to really feel good. It has to translate into feeling good. So try and measure the buddy program effectiveness. Okay. What are the benefits of onboarding? This is a textbook slide. Definitely effective, efficient onboarding reduces employee turnover. You will see the effect on reduced attrition. Infancy attrition will definitely come down because the person is being held on to a longer time. Higher employee engagement, faster time to proficiency, improving on the skills and producing better, reduced costs, which is a consequence of increase in proficiency, extensive uh, extension of the positive candidate experience. The positive candidate experience is a much talked about aspect when it comes to employer branding. People come and ask questions about your candidate experience. So if your onboarding is a long process, you get a positive candidate experience. You leave a positive candidate experience. Assimilation into the workplace culture becomes easier. 
understanding of role and the performance expectations of the role becomes easier all of this results in customer satisfaction you don't have to say that it happens as a consequence greater hiring manager satisfaction if the person is on board it effectively and efficiently your hiring manager is is likely to nominate you for an hr award okay and believe it or not as you are doing the onboarding process it becomes a very easy way for you to identify skill gaps and do a training need identification then and there without getting on to the next stage right i want to take a pause over there in case you have any questions or comments before we move on to uh, the third stage in the employee life cycle process which is talent development any comments here right okay so uh, when i the, the last point i put here is deliberately because it is a clean and neat link into the next aspect which is talent development because it's not that your onboarding stops on 90 days or 180 days and your talent development starts after that it is not a compartmentalized process in the life cycle there are huge overlaps talent development actually is a focus area right from day 1 so the moment the person comes on board talent development focus starts so when you are in your onboarding process you get a deeper understanding of the skills and the skill gaps things that you could have missed during the interview process you make very insightful and surprising discoveries i discovered that i had a potential marketing candidate in my hr mba intern right my onboarding showed me the various skills of marketing that she had and was willing to explore so when my marketing team needed somebody to make proposals i did not have to search outside it was very easy for me to transition somebody internally now this was an onboarding discovery strengths which are not there in the resume skills which are not there in the resume and areas of skill gaps where i needed to focus on in the next few months before a crisis looks at me on my face so talent development is not something which happens after the onboarding is over and that is where it makes a lot of sense to have hr meetings where people of various hr functions come together and discuss individuals in terms of talent development there could be insights which a recruiter might have had there could be insights which uh, a buddy might have had and that would be very very useful inputs for somebody who is designing the talent development plan or the talent development program talent development is an effort to build on employees existing skills at the same time identifying new skills and opportunities to achieve organizational goals please understand talent development is not a favor we are doing on employees it is an effort that is taken in order to achieve organizational goals and therefore looking at talent development initiatives as merely an investment on an employee and therefore trying to put bond amounts for every single training imparted may not be something which satisfies the moments of truth to so think about it before you jump into putting training bonds i'm not saying don't put training bonds if there is an investment made you have to fetch the return on investment definitely that's an organizational intent but don't jump on it as a standard practice think about it before you do it look at what is the achieve what have you achieved by training that person in something and you may not necessarily have to put a training bond unless there is a huge uh, you know feeling of vulnerability that the person might leave uh there is a very there's a very good book shaping the future uh, you know you know which is focused on talent development and it talks about fostering learning culture it talks about employee management employee engagement it talks about talent management and development and how do you drive organizational goals definitely uh talent development is not a one size fits all effort right because talent development like i said earlier it depends upon the employee's existing skills 
no two employees will be identical in terms of their existing skills and therefore it is absolutely important for you to develop individual talent development plans that needs to be designed career paths will be different the potential measurement will be different aspirations will be different so there are a lot of complexities and we are going to look at how do we do that why is talent development really needed there can always be argument saying whenever there is a requirement i will put up an advertisement i will get people on board it's easy talent is available why do you need to develop talent any thoughts why do you need to develop talent apart from what's there on the screen what are your first thoughts on this question why talent development ma'am to develop next generation leaders yeah yes not just leaders but to but to keep the development of skills going on may not be leaders but at every level yes what else already maybe not the best choice of words but to get more from the people we hire yes <laughs> of course of course you were bang on you read my mind it is definitely to get more look at it from from the organization's interest okay when i get somebody on board i am paying something for the services that the person brings in correct now if i have to get something more from that person i have to unlock all the hidden potential i have to identify the blind spots i have to look at what are those strengths which that person herself or himself is not aware of and that is talent development and why i am doing that is to get more out of that person that is exactly what i mean by unlocking people potential i have to hire somebody based on the skills he or she has told me in an interview okay so but when i am developing that talent i am also trying to unlock the hidden potential so when you don't do talent development when you every time look at you know getting candidates from outside when a new role opens and when you do a cost benefit analysis when you look at what happens to your wage bill with every new hire you will notice that you're ending up paying more for the same value you know there is a decision that manufacturing companies do build or buy you build this intermittent material or you buy it that is a very crucial decision in cost benefit analysis and that's precisely what happens here you build the talent internally or each time you buy do you you think it is better to cook at home and occasionally eat outside or does it make sense to buy food every day you're paying a premium when you are buying ready made food along with it you are buying a lot of health issues also that's that, let's keep it aside let's assume all uh, food is healthy that you buy but you're paying a premium for the effort that somebody else is putting in to cook for you rather if you cook at home you're cooking as per your taste you're cooking within your budget you're cooking to suit your needs the quantity to suit your needs so end of the day you're spending less when you cook at home so build or buy decision is what is important when it comes to why talent development your future proofing your organization you are not going overboard on your wage bill and when you are doing developing talent internally you are letting people know that we are valuing you as a professional we are investing in your growth that results in improved employee engagement you don't need to do fun activities for employee engagement when you are grooming talent internally developing talent internally you get diverse ideas and business opportunities imagine an hr person getting into proposal making that person goes with the flavor of human understanding and the proposal looks very different when it comes to writing it you develop more effective managers because when people grow in the ranks they are likely to be more empathetic kyunki saas bhi kabhi bahu thi i don't want to be a manager who did not treat me well so when you are developing me as a manager i try to look at how i can be a better manager it's possible right and when all of this happens retention of employees becomes better and like i said attrition is a symptom so retention becomes better okay so now it's time to do a bit of those reflections but now we are not going to spend too much ma'am yeah. ma'am i'll just take a, a minute 
yes 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 what you what you want to share here is that if a candidate is selected and his rating was 8 out of 10 by hr and operation hmm. and when he is onboarded then he comes at 6 or 6.5 hmm. now my point here is that you want to invest on him to scale up to 8 and 8.5 because the operation expectation is he to be a performer on day one Mm, mm. So how you will make a differentiate that our selection was wrong mm. uh, at the time of interview we uh, we were not able to judge him and now mm. he, because we always do a selection on the basic of his expectations of the organization from him mm, mm. but unfortunately he is not able to uh, uh, justify his selection mm. and what you are sharing is that let's do a, a, a talent development for him for the next yeah. two, three, four months. That is your uh, viewpoint? No, I'm not saying that invest in everybody. Uh, okay. Uh, if you, now this is a very, uh, what do you say? It's not a overnight change. We have to relook very critically our recruitment process. If your recruitment process is not very robust, if it is not bringing out the truth about the employee's capabilities, uh, then you're likely to be in a situation like this where the skill is not what it was at the time of hiring. But if your recruitment process is very strong and you notice that this person is not an 8 out of 10, but could be a 6.5 fit out of a 10, you go with that, you know, the selection is made consciously with that level of proficiency. So, so it's a white server, right? sir. It's a white yeah. server. Yeah, yeah. So when, okay. when you're consciously hiring with that level of proficiency, you're consciously willing to make that investment effort. The call you have to take is how long do I have to invest in this person so that he is becoming more proficient? Now, that's a conscious call. Now, when you have an adult to adult conversation with the hiring manager, you can make all these decisions at the time of deciding whether to hire this person or not then it becomes easy for you to invest in that person. And then the likelihood of that person not shaping up becomes very less. But your recruitment process, and that's why I spent a lot of time over there saying, you know, we need to relook how we get people right from attracting candidates to, to hiring. It has to be really, really done differently. Then the consequences here become much less. And that's precisely why the focus was a lot. But, in that but, you, but you are saying that scope is there for talent development. Yes, it's, yes, yeah. of course, yeah. of course. I See, suppose, I, yeah, I, you know, that when I say that this person has not really played this role, okay, he's uh, applying here for a higher role, uh, but in the interview, his approach of solving a crisis in the new role was acceptable, but he doesn't have that experience and therefore we will invest on him. Fair enough. And that is how new leaders are made, no? Because this person might be a cost-effective option for you. Someone with a higher potential but not already experienced in that role, but willingness to scale up worthwhile the investment. So win-win for all. Yeah, yeah, win-win for all. And if that person is, is showing you the ability to scale up, okay, you can invest on that person and that's how you develop new talent. That's how uh, you, you develop new leaders, right? So it's worth it. Yeah, but that person is absolutely has done the same work, donkey's years, and still not answered really well when you gave a crisis situation, you should not even select that person. So look at your recruitment process. It will make life a lot easier when you do it the right way, rather than only focusing on number of closed positions. Look at effectiveness of hiring. Then this becomes easy. Yeah. Right. So uh, we do not have too much time, but I would want you to take a minute and write down your talent development mission statement. I want to focus on talent development because it could be I want to develop leaders for the future. It could be I want to uh, build a future resilient organization. It could be I want to uh, develop the best of talent in my industry, whatever. But take a moment and write down your talent development mission statement. My talent development mission statement was I want to develop talent in my team because I want to make myself redundant. And I did that. I replaced somebody in my position who would give the, who would deliver the same at half my cost. Yeah, that's a, that's a good parting gift you're comp leaving your company with when you leave the organization, right? So even that can be your talent development mission statement, but write it down so that you're conscious about it. Um, Harini, one 
quick question, please. By mm. uh, when would we touch upon ROI? Um, ROI as formulae, I am not putting in, but definitely okay. we'll talk about ROI towards the end, where I want to talk about generally about return on investment and how do you calculate for all HR process. Sure. But very Thank specific you. formulae, you can always reach out to me and I can help you with that. Thank you. As you are doing this, also take a moment and write down what are the principles and values that drive talent development current, current leader organization and what you would want to do differently based on the five moments of truth. What is it that you want to measure when it comes to talent development? Measure what matters. How would you want to develop talent in your team so that agile teams are made how would you want to use talent development to drive innovation? Look at those moments of truth and write down the values that will drive your talent development process. And uh, Maheshwari, if, if I can take the liberty of asking you, I want you to share your inputs on this particular question. Uh, hi, Harini. Champa here. Yeah, I Champa. Have a, yeah, I have a question now. Uh, when uh, you're developing the talent, is a formal mm. certificate attracts these employees or you think just a grooming would help? Um, certificates have become very debatable these days. Okay. With okay. the plethora of self-learning modules all over the place, uh, everybody does all kinds of certification and e-certificates and there's this plenty that people get. So those have become a little debatable. But what is important in talent development is uh, one way to measure whether you have mm -hmm. developed talent in your team is if you're asking that person to write the personal purpose of the role every year as part of your annual appraisal process, right? Okay. What okay. is my purpose of my role? And if you see that there is a significant difference, that's a measure that you have developed talent there, right? So if I write my purpose of my role when I started off, let's say as a competent and functional trainee, I said mm -hmm. the purpose of my role is to understand anomalies in compensation and to uh, to highlight them and make efficient dashboards. After two years, the purpose of my role is to understand the reasons behind uh, the anomalies that have crept in and design programs of correcting those anomalies. My purpose has changed, which means I have learned something in the process. Okay, my skill gaps were identified, addressed, and I have learned something new and I'm able to look at my role differently. I'm not talking about designations anywhere. Designations could have changed, may not have changed. But the purpose of my role is different. I'm looking at it with a lot more content. That's a way to measure uh, talent development. So there is no certificate here, not required. And I'm not oh. falling into debate because, because I'm open to you testing my purpose and my ability. So that's what happens in my, in my performance appraisal, right? No certification required. Yeah, Maheshwari. So, uh, Harini, to what you just shared when we talk about the principle and the values, okay, the very first which stays at the core is, you know, alignment of organization need and the personal need of an individual. Mm. You know, you need to set mm. the alignment. Mm. Second mm. most crucial part is you put a competency framework at place. Mm. Okay. It mm. has to be complete learning path for an individual starting from the joining till what role he is or he or she is going to play mm. that would make a lot of sense and also you know it's, it's always very very crucial that you know you need to put certain parameters at practice to evaluate mm. okay mm. after mm. doing this program what kind of behaviors you want to see that's that's very very mm. crucial mm. Mm. the learning mm. program mm. Mm. so where the need comes in where is the success factor lies mm. Correct. So that's, that's, Correct. These are the inputs I would like to share from my side. Yes, definitely. So when you are saying this, now again, I want to connect with the moments of truth. When you're yes. talking about behaviors that mm -hmm. are expected as you're developing talent, you're, mm -hmm. you're actually very transparent about what is it that you want to see that individual as. And that builds mm -hmm. trust. Okay? Mm -hmm. When I say that in my talent development plan for you, I'm going to invest in building your people management skills. I'm telling that person that I'm looking at you as a people manager. I'm not saying I'm going to promote you in two years. Right? 
so the person is actually looking at the value and not looking at promotion as an activity so the negotiation of why did you not promote me in two years does not happen he starts measuring himself on have i developed those people management skills that are required for that role so the see the whole conversation is in a in a different frame right thanks for bringing that up definitely behaviors skills these are all things which so which you will try and develop based on what is expected of that person in the future and not what that person is lacking today alone thank you so much have a question Harini. yeah uh, pallavi yeah so uh, so like over, overall what we are talking about in their talent development my one question is there we are talking about to develop a talent but mm. uh, just to create their you know growth mindset I, hmm. i do you think that you know is just, that will just not help till the time we align them with the organizational yes. dynamic goal because you know developing them is a different thing but developing them and aligning them with the organizational absolutely. goal is uh, absolutely is, absolutely is actually very crucial part very very crucial so the movie poster that i said yeah. you have to actually in your mind that uh, you don't have to really create the movie poster then everybody yeah. will start looking for designers but i'm thinking in your mind and in, in communicating to the employee also Yeah. you have to be able to show showcase that person in the organization's big picture every time the i am so having 10 degrees but I, that hmm. degrees and skills are not helping organization to gain Correct. anything that will Correct. not help yes so when you define the purpose of your role you have to show that person or help that person to align or connect it with the organization's purpose yeah. if there is a strong connect then investing on that person in that area or reimbursing for any particular thing that he or she does makes a lot of sense so if somebody comes and approaches you saying i want to do this training program will the company sponsor me instead of giving a straight forward yes or no answer or jumping into a bond have a conversation saying by this training program how are you going to perform better in your role how is it going to help the organization fair enough expectation and if the person has a very clear way to articulate that is able to showcase as examples this crisis happened last time with this kind of a knowledge this kind of a network i will be able to deal with it better it is going to result in this kind of a difference to the customer fair enough okay it makes a lot of sense for you to build a case for getting sponsorship for that person okay depending on how long you want to retain you might want to put a training bond or you might don't put a bond but you say in case you leave within so much time you might want to recover the cost if it's too much and all that that's fine yeah. but your decision should not be based on i'll get an approval whether this is relevant or not let the person speak whether it is relevant or not and if that person is not able to establish the relevance he or she will automatically step back and say it's okay i will do it as a self sponsorship right so you're just building opportunities for adult to adult conversations let the decision making go to that person also Arini, I have a yeah. different question. Um, hmm. uh, the talent development process for an individual is uh, perfect. I mean, I understand. Hmm. I've gone through that myself. Hmm. Hmm. How do we uh, do make that relevant for the others who are not in the same process and hmm. stop them from demoralizing or disengaging from the activity? Like you know, hmm. I'll give you a generic statement. A lot of people, oh, she's getting this because I've got a psychological training, and then I hmm. my peers didn't get it. Mm. um because i i looked the need for it i asked for it i got it but there mm. was this mm. peer disengagement or the conflict in the team saying that you know mm. or she got it for whatever reason and mm. the others didn't mm. get it mm. how do you mm. handle or address that particular issue yeah so once it becomes an issue it's very difficult to handle so what we are going to do now is we're only going to look at what we can do to prevent such things to happen from the, in the future uh right if it has happened it has happened uh, you can't do much because this is like a huge collision right but what do you do to prevent that collision is in your performance appraisal process let people talk about aspirations not only as an optional question to answer but as a very important question to answer as a key focus area in the performance appraisal discussion and document those aspirations ask them to talk about how do they intend to build themselves on their aspirations and why how are they going to add value to their role in the organization and to the organization's goal have that conversation with everybody without exception 
then there is no room for saying that that person went ahead, asked for it, got it. But if it has happened, it has happened. You can't do anything to undo that. But as a process, we talk about performance appraisal purely as a look back on what has happened. But it should also give equal and more focus on looking forward as to how are you going to do things differently and how can we as an organization help you. If that <clears throat> conversation happens, you have given any everybody equal opportunity to talk about aspirations. Because so at this point, people, uh, there would be people who won't be upfront talking about what they want to do. You know, they may be good people. So we should give them that psychological safety to put their views across. Yeah. Arni, ma'am. Okay. Yes. Uh, during performance improvement plan, hmm. can we invest on a development? Yes. So, uh, okay. Uh, a word of caution on performance in, in improvement plans is, when do you put somebody on a PIP? When you're very sure that this person has potential or willingness to improve, this person has been dormant, but we can shake him or her up then you put that person on a PIP. But a PIP has to be very focused. It has to show clearly what are you investing for and how is the person going to get that investment of development and who is going to work with that person. It has to be clear. It has to be an undertaking properly acknowledged by both. I cannot, if I'm a bad performer, I cannot be put on a PIP plan where somebody is only going to observe my performance. Where am I going wrong? Okay. And I'm going to perform the same way. At the end of 90 days also, I will end up performing the same way. And then you tell me 90 days, you didn't complete your PIP successfully, you're out. Unfair. If it's a performance improvement plan, you are putting that person on a PIP because there are gaps. You have to clearly show who and how support is going to be given so that those gaps are covered. People have to invest in that PIP. Of course, you if you want to see whether it is too much of an investment, you want to abort it in between, you can have checkpoints in between. You may not have to invest 90 days on everybody. It's too much of an investment. Who will put that much time? So you can say 30 days, we will do a checkpoint. We will see whether your potential is still there. We will give you also an opportunity to say, are you moving forward? Are you happy with your movement? And then take a decision. Have those conversations intermittently, but PIP requires investment by the organization also. You cannot just observe a person on PIP and that's that's absolutely unfair. Uh, Pallavi, you still want to say something or ask something? No, no, I have done. Sorry. Okay, okay. Uh, Harini, just very quickly, if if mm. we don't reach to a point of performance appraisal, which happens like on a, a yearly basis or a mid-year assessment, mm. can, is it fair to ask these aspirational questions in the interview at the interview stage or is it too much at that stage? Um, okay, uh, we unfortunately, we end up waiting for annual performance appraisals, mm. but uh, talking about aspirations, don't call it aspirations, but even if you talk about uh, what's your purpose today? What do you think will be your purpose to be in this organization six months down the line? If you ask these two questions as part of your induction coffee table conversations, you will get a lot of insights. It will, it will tell you whether this person is likely to be in your organization for six months and one year and so on. Okay, I'll give you an example. Uh, one guy uh, left our organization from the project management role. Uh, he left um, and uh, I happened to interview him uh, after about two years after he left for, for taking him back. And everyone told me he left suddenly, he left uh, abruptly. He's not somebody whom we can rely on. We should not take him back. Of course, I had done enough of background investigation on how good he is in terms of his behavior. Uh, what was his conduct? How was his interpersonal relationship with the customer? Uh, it was a project management, so with the client and a whole lot of things. I had done a lot of background research and there was nothing which was really alarming. So in a conversation with him, when I asked him to reflect on his purpose of earning, okay, I wanted to probe and see what is his purpose and what was his purpose when he left the organization and what is his purpose today. And what came out very distinctly was at that time, he wanted to explore his uh, hobby in investment banking. 
he wanted to try his hand in the stock market there were a lot of things where his purpose was to generate wealth okay 3 years down the line his purpose is to showcase his skills in project management his purpose has changed then it became easy for me to get into a conversation of how long you're going to be retained here how long do you wish to be here what is it that you want to do in the next 3 years for this organization he was at ease to talk about his future in this organization and believe it or not he is still in that in that organization this interview uh, with him i did 7 years ago and the people had predicted that he will leave in 6 months he is still there and i think he got an award for a best project manager recently right so when you ask them to define their purpose and and you notice how their purpose has traveled it will give you a lot of insights on where to invest in developing that Yes, yeah, so I'm only saying look at HR as a value-adding, enabling function, and not as a task function, task-based function with the checklist of tasks. So try to look at HR. Try to look at your own role differently, and come up with a lot of such creative ideas, right? So, some talent development best practices is, of course, start with your organizational objectives. That's where we spoke about alignment of individual objectives to organizational objectives or goals. and that will help you to identify areas of upskilling and reskilling when you have organizational goals articulated department wise function wise team wise you'll be able to identify which are those areas where we need to have skilled people where we need upskilling of existing people or we need to reskill somebody design a learning road map a learning road map is not a training calendar a learning road map will have areas of learning why you want to develop learning why you want to do those training programs for development in those areas what is the outcome you are expecting and how are you measuring the effectiveness when you measure the effectiveness of learning you will actually end up creating a continuous learning culture learning doesn't stop leadership should also get into the habit of learning and development at every stage when you are part of an organization that is looking at a growth there is something that you have to improve in yourself and this is something which has to be a culture in the organization where even leaders are subject to learning promote performance coaching and not performance measurement right when you are doing a performance appraisal conversation focus has to be on the future look forward promote performance coaching get aspirations there look at what commitment i can do for helping that person to grow in the organization coach managers to make themselves redundant okay teach them step back management one simple rule step back to step up if you want to step up in your career graph you have to learn to step back so that your team members start taking more ownership and accountability help managers come out of that insecurity and feeling of threat that's what you do in performance coaching and hr people are the best to help managers become facilitators and coaches coaches move moving away from micromanagement engage all stakeholders so when you are developing a performance development plan individual development plan when you're designing your organization's learning road map don't do it as an individual hr activity or an lnd team activity get all stakeholders involved because your learning road map has to tightly align and deliver to the organizational goals you cannot have a learning road map which is running parallel to your organizational goal you will not get sponsorship from any of your uh, business heads so engage them when you are designing your learning road map so these are a few of the talent development best practices but when you do those reflections in the workbook in the in the bigger workbook you will have all those questions to answer for for this yep uh, i'm moving a little fast now for want of time but the workbook will have you to answer a lot of questions around these areas even otherwise the light workbook which talks about what is the purpose of talent development if you answer that with a lot of focus and in a meditative space you will be able to crack your uh, talent development best practice let's move on to retention another important area uh, 
first let's understand what retention is it is not simply reducing attrition chal chal piche padha padha okay uh, somebody is uh, unmuted somebody is unmuted can you all please go on mute if you're not talking yeah thank you so retention of employees is not simply reducing attrition retaining people means also keeping them significantly engaged if i am not leaving the organization just because jobs are not available that's not a great form of retention if you are able to retain somebody by making a counter offer that's not really retention okay you're simply reducing attrition at that point in time but you're not really retaining that person because that person is mentally made up to leave you make a counter offer you hold back that person but you're not going to retain because you're also giving that person enough opportunity to negotiate higher in the outside market so holding back somebody reducing attrition at in that point of time is not really retention reflect on that retention of right talent is important just to get your attrition numbers down if you're trying to make counter offers or stay interviews with people and stay, making them stay back it may not impact on your retention in the right manner attrition is natural and sometimes you have to let it happen some positions you can be comfortable if people leave earlier than expected it doesn't matter you don't have to feel bad about every case that is leaving the organization and attrition is a symptom you cannot treat a symptom you have to treat the disease and the symptom will disappear on its own or will reduce on its own so reflect on these uh, moments of truth under retention and uh, this activity is what is your key purpose of retention in your organization why do you want to retain people answer this question take a moment answer this question while you're answering this question also identify what are those values and principles that drive retention right now and what are those values and principles that you wish to have when you want to retain people in the future look at the trends of the future look at the current trends retain and remember retention is not simply reducing attrition look at the moments of truth reflect and answer these two questions what is the key purpose of retention and what are the principles and values that drive retention in your organization currently and what you wish to do i'll give you two three minutes to answer both the questions and you don't have to respond with this question just write it down.
Thanks, Anusha, for putting it on the chat. And uh, Pallavi had asked uh, for, for my contact details. That will be on the last slide of this deck. So anyways, you will have it with you. So not putting Thanks. it out here. Thanks. Right. So uh, having done that, again, like every other uh, process in the employee life cycle, even for uh, retention, write down who does what. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, for a lot of the HR processes, I used to have the habit of building a RASI matrix. A RASI matrix is a grid which talks about who is responsible, who is accountable, who has to be consulted and who has to be informed. R-A-C-I. You can search on the internet. R-A-C-I, RASI matrix. It is very, very useful for you to define who does what. So when it comes to employee retention, it's again everyone who is working with the employee directly or indirectly is involved and is responsible for retention. Many a time, even the housekeeping staff who are supporting the organization are also responsible for retention. I have come across cases where people quit because of unhygienic conditions in the office, right? So retaining employees is something where you're making the person feel a part of the whole. And every one of us is responsible for retaining the other. So it's not that only HR is responsible for retaining all the employees. Everyone is responsible for retaining HR as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a complex network. Okay. So it's very important for us to be able to understand clearly who does what when it comes to retention. So try building that as well when you go back to your workplace. Some of the best practices in retention is it's very important to gather employee insights. I want to spend a couple of minutes here on this. Why I've put that as a first point here is, uh, you know, when a lot of people take this slightly differently and they say, okay, we will have grievance forums and suggestion boxes to gather insights. But when you formalize it into a grievance forum or a suggestion box method, what happens is people come with a very fixed agenda. So in a grievance forum, because there is a forum, I will imagine a grievance and come and talk about it. You're giving me a chance to talk about a grievance, right? Rather, have agenda-less conversations. Okay, something that I practiced and uh, feel free to use it. Uh, it is my IP, but you can feel free to use it and wherever possible, do give credit. It's called as Walk the Talk. It was a very, very, very successful initiative, which my team ran beautifully in my last organization. Walk the Talk is a very simple way of gathering insights in a in an agenda-less, informal manner. Some of you who have heard me before would even be aware of it. In Walk the Talk, what happens is every HR team member takes accountability of being the champion for maybe 20, 20 employees. Right? Allow your HR team members to choose whom they want to be employee champions with. It need not be by department or whatever. Give them complete freedom to choose. Right? Uh, it's very easy to do in smaller organizations. In larger organizations, you may go by department. And let your HR team member have conversations with each of those employees for whom they are champions once every fortnight, which means if I have 20 people for whom I am the HR champion, I will meet each one of those 20 people one-on-one -on -one, twice a month. Every fortnight, I will meet that person. So I can decide whether I meet this person while having tea, whether I decide to travel with this person, whether I have a lunch meeting, whatever. But it will be an agendaless, impromptu, informal meeting. As in, you will not send a meeting invite. And you will just say that, hey, I would like to join you for lunch today. Uh, so why don't we go uh, at this time, right? So how, how are things happening? And what's new in your area? What's exciting? Talk about, engage, engage in a conversation. And let that person feel free to talk about anything with absolute psychological safety. Why I'm saying informal is the person knows that there won't be a consequence to this conversation, right? So with that psychological safety, they will say, yeah, work is great. Great opportunities are coming, but somehow I don't think my skills are getting utilized. Now that becomes an alarm for you. Probe a little deeper. You get to know a lot of things about what can disengage this particular employee, what can frustrate this person. 
Now that becomes very crucial information for you to work on certain initiatives for retention. When you go back to this person in the next fortnight, it becomes an accountability for you to go back with some ideas where you can ease the frustration. Small frustrations can be eased by speaking. Larger frustrations, you may have to do certain actions to drive a change. But what happens is you're building a momentum, you're building a rhythm where you're having constant transactions between a stakeholder who is your internal customer and you yourself as an HR service provider, where you're enabling that person to speak up and you're enabling, equipping yourself to come out with solutions before they become bigger problems. This is not as easy as I'm speaking. So think about it. Think of ways in which you will gather employee insights because that will help you to come up with retention ideas. Retention effort starts from the date of hiring. Just like onboarding goes on up to maybe as long as a year in the organization, retention starts at the time of hiring. Retention is not when somebody tries to resign. Retention starts from the date of hiring. What am I doing to see that you see continuous value in this organization. What am I be doing to show that we acknowledge the value that you are bringing in? This starts from day one. This is exactly what I mean when I say, how are you showing that person as part of that big picture? It starts from day one. Retention starts there. Design recognition schemes. Recognition schemes need not be only monetary. It can be non-monetary. It can be environmental. Uh, retain, your recognition schemes can be like allowing somebody to practice a new skill without fear of failure. Even that is a recognition scheme, right? All those experiments you can do. Upgrade your compensation and benefits program regularly. You need not be the best paymaster, but you should be able to be transparent about your compensation programs. I have been I have led Compenben for a company where we were paying at the 40th percentile of the market, but we were able to retain people because we were absolutely open and transparent about why, who was paid, how much. When people came asking about why somebody is being paid a skill allowance, I said, come, let me show you what is the impact of that skill on the business, right? So if you're transparent about why you're paying somebody how much, and if you refrain from putting statements, repulsive statements like compensation is confidential between you and the company and do not discuss with anybody, remove that statement. Be more transparent. By putting that statement, are people stopping discussions about compensation? No. You're only trying to put an unnecessary control and you're building child ego state in your employees. Refrain from that. Instead, keep upgrading your compensation and benefits program. Give them more value for money in your benefits program. Insurance benefits. Many companies renew their insurance plans, health insurance plans as is year on year. But try to see for the same premium per person, are you able to negotiate for more value added services? If you are in a manufacturing business, are you able to extend ambulance service for their families during work days, work hours? And are you able to include that as part of the, one of the benefits in your family insurance plan? Think of all those things. Those are all ways in which you can upgrade your compensation program without increasing your cost. Look for more value added services and do that regularly. Don't do it only because somebody else is doing it. Provide visible career paths. Career path need not be promotion every two years. Career path is, we are an organization that is open to talk about your aspirations, what you are willing to do as your personal investment of time, effort, and money, and how we can compensate and help you to achieve what you want to become. How do we help you to rewrite your purpose every year? Make those things visible in your thoughts, words, and actions. Do it for a few people, and you're consistent with your thoughts and words. More and more people will be encouraged to do it. And of course, engage all stakeholders. This is not only an HR's role. Retention is something where everybody has a skin in the game when an employee has to be retained. Okay. Uh, we have about 10 minutes to close. So I'll quickly move on to 
the offboarding process and why i wanted to touch up on offboarding is offboarding is something that completes the end of a professional relationship okay so uh, we we looked at offboarding as layoffs retirement contract termination whatever it could be anything resignations whatever but what i wanted to caution you here is take offboarding more seriously than any other employee touch point because a person who is exiting your organization is leaving a little bit of the culture behind second thing is the person who is exiting your organization is going to enter into another organization or is going to enter into the marketplace and he is carrying with you your employer brand so your exiting employee is your biggest ambassador so even if somebody is being terminated laid off because of lack of work in the organization do it with so much grace and dignity that that person rem- remains your ambassador for the rest of his or her life i've had the misfortune to do a lot of layoffs because every business that i went into that particular industry segment unfortunately went into severe retention uh, recession when i stepped in so i had to do all of these as part of my role but all of this was done with a lot of compassion with a lot of hand holding with a lot of good intent of taking that person back when situations change and also demonstrating whatever we said so if you uh, so reflect on your as as a homework you can do this reflect on your offboarding practice look at what are the principles values that you should uh, to drive your offboarding process and who does what and of course let's quickly look at the uh, offboarding process be very transparent about the entire process especially if it is an involuntary uh, offboarding that you have to do if it's a termination or an end of contract or any such thing be very very transparent even if it is a misconduct be very transparent i would advise very strongly do not use the word termination even for a misconduct case when you're issuing a letter issue a letter of cessation of service avoid using the word termination put yourself in the person's shoes okay you are absolutely fine to clean up the mess in your organization but you have no right to ruin anybody's career it could have been a one off mistake and that person may never ever repeat it and cessation of services from your organization is a fair enough punishment for that person we have no right to ruin that person's ability to take up another employment however when it comes to you for an employment verification or a conduct verification you can you can and you ought to be very transparent about it no doubt but ensure that you do not use the word termination and when you're not using the word termination you're also safeguarding yourself from having to go for a for you know representing your organization in a labor court if that person takes you to the labor court right? i have a quick Because question I, here yeah how do we hmm. handle the gdpr rules in terms of background verification uh, specifically in in such cases of you know uh, termination or whatever yeah so gdpr is uh, again there are a lot of ambiguities and vaguenesses so you have to put a lot of safeguards in place Uh, it is definitely applicable for countries that are in europe or that have a footprint in europe or that will be getting resources from europe right so uh, that is what that in- incites a lot of uh, uh, the-, the penalties associated with gdpr but when it comes to background verification as long as you are taking a consent from the candidate about background verification and the purpose of background verification it is fair enough safeguard uh, i've got uh, you know i consulted an expert on this and i was told that you need see background verification need not be about what was the last drawn salary it's immaterial exactly you don't even have to ask for last three pay slips okay now that is where the gdpr violation happens right uh we practice that but we've all forgotten to see why we are asking those questions my intent of asking that question is is this person of high integrity right so let me find out different ways of finding now what the last company paid him as salary is immaterial don't even ask that question 
because you are paying salary for the current role that you're hiring that person, not for the last drawn salary. Right? You don't have to ask for pay slips. You don't have to ask for uh, you know a relieving letter. Right? You may want to do a background verification. Tell that person I'm going to find out about more about you from your previous employer. Are you comfortable with me doing that? Let your questions be around this person. Get into an engaging conversation with the HR of the previous company and find out not only HR the manager as well and find out about this person. A lot of truths will emerge. You can just validate the information that the candidate has just told you, and that is good enough for background verification. And by this, you are not violating any GDPR regulations. Yeah. Uh, we are running short of time, and therefore I'm speeding up on this, but I'm happy to do one-on-one -on -one conversation. So feel free to reach out to me at the end of it. Right. So be transparent about why you are uh, offboarding a person. Avoid abruptness. Even in misconduct, do not be abrupt. Confront the person in a closed room, describe the misconduct, how it has impacted the organization and how you cannot tolerate misconduct in behavior and walk that person out gracefully so that nobody intercepts him on the way and there is no scene that is created. I've even done walking a person who was, there was a misconduct of theft of a high priced item in the office. It is definitely a misconduct, not acceptable. But we gave the person a cessation of services letter. We did not ask him to resign. Okay, cessation of services itself is an indication that this person must have had a, a black spot in his career. That's good enough punishment. Okay, you need not go beyond that. And we we walked that person home. We actually got him a cab and ensured that he's home and in safe hands. Because understand. That person, if he's gen if he's not a habitual troublemaker, uh, he might go through a severe emotional turmoil. And if something happens between leaving your office and reaching home, you're still accountable for that person because people at home do not know that the services are terminated, right? So anything can happen. So do not leave room for those mishaps. Ensure that you're not abrupt and you're giving time for assimilation. Tomorrow he's going to wake up with no job. So give time for assimilation. Be compassionate. There's no harm in being compassionate even with a troublemaker. Right? Provide support as long as you can, as much as you can, and engage all stakeholders. HR should not get into the conversation of doing a termination conversation one-on-one. -on -one. Engage all stakeholders. You're simply letting the person know that this is not HR's doing. I just want to bring to you the famous Mahindra, uh, Tech Mahindra audio clip that went viral on social media seven, eight years back, where an HR employee gave a pink slip over a phone call. Absolutely horrible thing to do. And the consequence of that is that a trade union of sorts has been created also for the white collared workers. We've invited that trouble and now we have to deal with it, right? So it's very important for you to engage all stakeholders so that the person who is being terminated is fully aware why that action is being taken. And for voluntary resignations, engage stakeholders, uh, stay with a commitment of being in touch, start building your organization's alumni. You might want to get some people back Right, organizational alumni works great when you want to get the best people back. You might be able to do it at a future date. Bring stakeholders into it so that those conversations also happen. And the person who leaves leaves as an ambassador of your organization. Um, so here are my contact details. And while this will stay on the screen, I just want to address the question by Ruth on uh, ROI in HR practices. Uh, every employee touch point measurement of ROI is very useful when you're trying to showcase the value that you're bringing to the table. Uh, because a lot of HR work is uh, intangible, so it's very important to measure return on investment. Uh, it's easy to measure ROI in some uh, areas like training, because training has a very clear cost associated with it, and you can measure effectiveness by using what is the impact the training has caused in the nature of work? You can do various uh, tests, surveys, et cetera. You can ask for customer feedback on a very specific point after each training program. And you can use that as the 
measuring the for measuring the return on investment that so much has been the cost of training and so much has been the reduction due to errors and you can show that ratio as a return on investment uh, for measuring roi of recruitment practices you can you can look at all the costs associated with recruitment do remember to add the hourly or the time uh, the cost of the time involved by everybody who's participating in the recruitment many a time in cost of recruitment we forget to add the salaries of the recruitment panel members so if your vice president your manager assistant manager team leader four people and hr man talent acquisition manager five people are sitting in a panel interview for one hour what is the hourly cost of all these people added together that will be the cost of that interview they ensure that you capture all of these and when you are making a package for an individual see that you are getting a return on that investment so that's an roi for recruitment similarly return on investment for comp and ben practices very very clearly if your wage bill average wage bill it's a very simple thumb rule the total of all your salaries divided by total number of employees top to bottom no exceptions that will give you your average salary as long as your average salary is constant or only slightly increasing it means you have fetched sufficiently good return on investment you are paying the same kind of salary but for a different set of people that's what it means your average salary doesn't go up i was once given a mandate by my ceo saying you give 25% increase to your top talent but average salary should not go up 11 lakhs per year fix it it made me think about different ways so one of the things that i did is i looked at whether i can change the ratio of laterals versus freshers more number of freshers lesser laterals which gives me a cost advantage can i look at uh, understanding uh, different skills niche skills hot skills can i only pay them the premium okay can i look at hiring replacements at the junior level and push people up will that give me a cost advantage different scenarios different cost advantages are possible but these are creative ways so if you want to measure your return on investment use your comp and ben metric of average salary total number of i mean total amount of salary paid per year that is all the annual salaries added together divided by total number of people in the organization so with that i just want to wrap up right on time uh don't want to hold you back uh, from your lunch on saturday afternoon it might be family time for most of you uh but i am here this is a relationship which is just begun thanks to core hrir and thanks to hrci for allowing us to use their official seal for these four credit hours uh feel free to reach out to me we can have this conversation going uh if you're looking at implementing some of these practices in your organization if it involves a uh, more investment of my time we can get into that conversation as well for people who are practicing hr in organizations and for others who want to have one on one conversations always free to do with that i would like to wrap up uh, and i uh, this slide deck will be sent out to all those who have attended uh so this is a light version of the workbook so all those who are even watching on uh, youtube if there is a possibility that we can check who has attended you will get that uh, and uh, people who have uh, who have actually attended for the hrci credit hours you will also get a heavy workbook uh, thank you so much for your patience and for this extremely high engagement i noticed pretty lot uh, deep engagement by those who spoke and even those who shared in the comment box thanks a lot and uh, back to the core hrir team for a wrap up are you have been very progressive i must say that one statement i haven't yeah. seen anybody so good thank you thank, thank you, you so Harini. much I, yeah when i joined i thought well, you know it must be one of those random things but it was amazing thank you so much thank, thank you so much and to thank hear you, it from you it's thank exactly. you so much man. thank you so much harini thank you harini it was great knowing you so much of new perspectives yeah actually harini i would like to add on this point that i always being an hr i always had this uh, conflict you know i i always wanted to do something different which was all and i'm very happy to 
saying these things and coming from you and you know that validates that you know i wasn't wrong <laughs> so i please please do so take much. the oath, oath of hr seriously <laughs> and try to put that into practice and you will see a world of difference you will start taking pride in your role yeah i always get into that you know thing that uh, whether i'm doing right or wrong it and uh, typically it shouldn't happen but uh, i think thank you for giving us that confidence that yes welcome. we can do welcome, welcome. Thank, thank you so much ma'am uh, you know it's always pleasure to hear you every time when i hear you i get lot of insights lot of things to learn and understand and you know it takes me around uh, 15 days to absorb all these things to read again and again and again <laughs> my pleasure thank you so much and that that's a huge validation if you're if it if it's leaving you enough uh, you know card to ruminate on to reflect on uh, then i feel that i've done a good job so uh, whatever Uh, whatever is being spoken here it has to stay on with you for a longer time that's my intense desire so thanks for saying that uh, from me harini i'll definitely get in touch with you later as well thank you so much it was very sure, sure. thank you a lot for uh, yeah. anything in particular that you uh, you can suggest maybe one of your earlier webinars that i can watch for impact assessment maybe or on training impact um, assessment I I'm not sure if it is there on my YouTube channel. I've not upda- uploaded a lot for a long time, but I'll let me look for it and I'll uh, share it with you. Sure, uh, reach I'll out to me. Uh, just remind me. Yeah, yeah, I'll sure. definitely. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot. And uh, I'm leaving the meeting right now. And uh, stay in touch. Bye, bye, everyone. Thank you so much.